Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will now call the June 15th regular meeting of the School Board of Palm Beach County or to order at 5.03 p.m. Ms. Bellotta, please call the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. Here. We have quorum with all seven board members in attendance. Also joining us is Superintendent Michael Burke, General Counsel Sean Bernard. Inspector General Teresa Michael will be with us shortly and board clerk Tony Bellotta. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. Would you please all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by the superintendent. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. In the event that the link is interrupted for technical reasons, please switch over to the TV channels. All board meetings are recorded in their entirety and posted on the district website within 24 hours. We also offer a listening-only option, which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting, is, uh, meeting ID is 1-561-880-1124, pound sign. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so if you speak tonight, please remember to speak at a reasonable pace. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome any public speakers who are joining us today. The school board supports the peaceful assembly of persons to express themselves regarding matters concerning district students, employees, and the community. Please adhere to the safety protocols that were provided to you upon entry in which outline in more detail what is expected. As a reminder, public comments must relate to the subject matter of the agenda item for which the speaker had requested to address. Pursuant to school board policy, speakers whose comments do not relate to the topic that the speaker indicated, including but not limited to the mention of any person's candidacy for elected office, are subject to having the microphone turned off and forfeiting the right to speak at the remainder of today's meeting. Again, your attendance here at the board meeting is appreciated. Thank you for helping us to maintain decorum, civility, and the orderly conduct of school board business. Board members, we have 10 items of, of a minutes on the, uh, on the agenda. We need a motion to approve those minutes. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We have added three items to the agenda for good cause. FMPA 13, consultant agreement with the Reef Whisperer LLC. Good cause exists for adding FMPA 13 to this agenda to allow for required maintenance of Lim Limestone Creek's aquariums. Item LR1, tentative agreement with Palm Beach County Police Benevolent Association. Good cause exists for adding this item to the agenda. The reason to make this recommendation at this time is that it is important to the district to enable timely processing of employee salary increases. A tentative agreement with PBA was reached on June 6th, 2022. And item P3, personnel addendum, good cause exists for adding this item so that employees can begin in their new positions as soon as possible. Mr. Superintendent, are you withdrawing any items? No, sir. Board members, other than what you've already indicated to the board clerk, do you have any additional items you wish to withdraw at this time? Our poll at this time. Uh, we need a motion then to approve the uh, agenda. Motion by Mrs. Woodfield, seconded by Mrs. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Are there any disclosures or abstentions by the board members? Seeing none, Mr. Superintendent, we'll move on to comments. Yes, I wanted to share. Uh, yesterday we held what we called our grand hiring event. Uh, we're actively recruiting across the board of, for basically every job in the district. And we were pleased we had 531 interviews. Uh, all of our schools were involved. And I'm anxious to find out how many of those interviews led to a, a contract and a new hire. And we'll report back later when we get all that data. Recruitment's going to continue to be a major area of focus for us throughout the summer. And we want to be as staffed up as possible when we start the new school year on August 10th. Uh, School safety is also, you know, top of mind for all of us, and it's always our highest priority here in Palm Beach County. Tonight's agenda includes two items, 
as we continue to do everything we can to make our schools as safe as possible. Uh, you have a, a recommendation for a new crisis alert hard panic button solution that I think will give us another layer of uh, security. And also we have, uh, as Mr. Barbieri mentioned, we have our cell, uh, contract settlement with the Police Benevolent Association, which is the uh, bargaining unit for all of our police officers. And this is gonna help us provide a uh, competitive salary package and also aid in our recruitment as we work to make sure we get our force fully staffed up. You know, this is our first regular meeting since we completed the school year and held our 32 graduation ceremonies. Those ceremonies I was really proud to be a part of. Uh, they went off seamlessly. Uh, they were well attended uh, by the community, both in person and virtually with over 100,000 views online thanks to our communications team and uh, probably about 150,000 people passing through the fairgrounds. So I wanted to take a minute tonight to recognize all of the hard work that went into that. Uh, as the board well knows, uh, we have a gentleman, Mr. Eric Stern, that uh, has a full-time job already in our uh, curriculum and teaching and learning division, but he also takes on an additional assignment each year to coordinate this huge event, and he just does an amazing job with it. Uh, he's got partners that support him with this, uh, but he's the leader. Uh, I want to also recognize Mr. Andrew Ruiz from our communications team. He, he was at all the ceremonies, helped working right alongside with Mr. Stern. Uh, we had uh, our police team. Um, I always refer to him as Officer Sal, but I'm drawing a blank on his last name right now. So Mr. Stern, help me out when you get up here. Longo, Officer Longo. Uh, and Ms. Officer Auger also was a, a, a fixture there throughout all the ceremonies. I want to also thank the principals uh, and their respective teams for coming in prepared. The students were well rehearsed, and it was just a, a great thing to be a part of. I would like to take a minute to, uh, to recognize Mr. Stern, Mr. Ruiz, and if the board would be kind enough to join me, we'd like to take a picture with the, with the crew uh, in front of the dais. Mr. Ruiz, did, <laughs> Mr. Stern? <laughs> All right, thank you. Maybe just you go. Okay, all right, you know it's just gonna be me. <laughs> Sorry, I had a mix up there. I got in the habit of taking pictures during the graduation ceremony, sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, well, the other exciting news tonight, I wanna uh, welcome Mr. Ed Tierney, our deputy superintendent, up to the table. Uh, we've been busy hiring uh, principals as we've had retirements and openings. Uh, we have two principals with us here tonight that Mr. Tierney will introduce, and they are first-time principals, so they get the honor of being able to introduce themselves to the school board and the community. Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chairwoman, Mrs. Brill, School Board Members, Superintendent Burke, I'm very pleased this evening to have the opportunity to introduce our two newest principals. The Jupiter Elementary community wanted a new leader who would celebrate diversity and inclusion and be an excellent communicator and visible as well. So I am very, very pleased to introduce Ms. Gloria Salazar. Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chairman Brill, School Board Members, and Superintendent Burke. I am absolutely honored to be here tonight, and I would like to begin by thanking Mr. Burke um, and Mr. Tierney for trusting in my leadership to be the next principal of Jupiter Elementary. I would also like to thank Dr. Camille Long and Mrs. Bishop for your support as I transition from being the proud assistant principal to the proud principal of Jupiter Elementary. Thank you, Mrs. Daly and the entire JES Braves family for supporting me. It will be my top priority to make sure that students and staff continue to feel safe 
as we educate, affirm, and inspire our children to greatness. I would like to take a minute to thank all who have believed in my leadership and given me amazing opportunities and above all have mentored me along the way. Ms. Suzanne Machuela and Mrs. Pamela Buckman for teaching me how to be a great leader right out of the classroom. Mrs. Buckman, you took me under your wing and I hope to follow your great lead. Mrs. Vivian Green and Dr. Abrams for believing, me, believing in me as I began as an assistant principal at Pahokee Elementary. My family for being my biggest supporters. I love you guys. Finally, I would like to thank my mother, who is hands down my number one fan. Thank you for always being by my side to guide me and mentor me to the best so that I am the best that I can be. Your support, your support both personal and professional, in my professional life means the world to me. Thank you. Congratulations, Principal Salazar. Palmetto Elementary community look for a principal to continue to provide innovative opportunities for both staff and students, so I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Danny Moya. Hi. Uh, uh, Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chairman Brill, uh, school board members, Mr. Burke. Uh, first, let me allow, allow me to express my gratitude as, for being selected as the new principal of Palmetto Elementary. I've had the uh, wonderful experience for the past 10 years to serve as the assistant principal there uh, and serving this community. Uh, it is a community and families that are near and dear to my heart. I see myself in those faces that come every day to our doors. Uh, so I look forward to doing the same in the, in the, in the role as principal going forward. Uh, I would like to say a few thank yous first to the school board, our, our representative, Ms. Ayala, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Burke, Mr. Tierney, also central region leadership, uh, Mrs. Haynes and Dr. Sanders for the opportunities and the support all the way around. Um, I'd also like to say um, to my original heroes, my, my mother and my father, for sacrificing everything to give myself and my brothers all the opportunities in this world. Uh, to my other brothers, my three older brothers, to teach me perseverance, which came in handy as the youngest of four <laughs> uh, boys. I had to learn that very quickly. Uh, as well as to my mentor, Mrs. Gladys Harris, my principal who I've learned uh, from every day for the last 10 years. Uh, and to my Palmetto faculty and staff. Uh, with whom I've built great relationships in the years, and I look forward to doing so going forward. Uh, last but not least, to my love of my life, my daughter, Taya. Um, she has taught me more about courage, compassion, and uh, love than anybody else in this world. Uh, Daddy loves you, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations, Principal Moya. That concludes my comments. All right. Uh, board comments, Ms. Burrell. Thank you. So please indulge me tonight because I, my comments are going to be a little bit more lengthy than normal. But I want to start also with a huge thank you to Eric Stern, Andrew Ruiz, and the team from 10, and all of the school police who coordinated the absolutely seamless graduations that we attended. So thank you, thank you. Um, the communications department's going to help me with the rest of what I'm going to be presenting. The Holocaust Documentation and Education Center announced the 2022 winning entries of the annual Jean and Jules Kluger Annual Visual Arts and Writing Contest. The 2022 theme was what is the most important lesson you have learned about the Holocaust and why? We had two schools with four students total who won first place in this contest. Matthew Arpia from Eagles Landing Middle School and his teacher, Susan Prieto. Brianna Delhomme, Amla, Amila, sorry, Dauphine, and Irana Sales from Lantana Middle School whose teacher was Nadia Filain. I'd like to share with you their artwork and the artist statements. So the first one, if you can go back one, or we'll, okay, there we go. So the first one is Matthew, and Matthew's statement was that the most important lesson I learned from the Holocaust is to never lose hope. This lesson is very important because if you stop believing that good things will happen to you, they will stop happening to you. You have to never give up hope and persevere, even if times are hard, in my drawing, one of the wires of the fence became a live flower. This represents hope and freedom. One of my inspirations for this drawing, for drawing this piece 
is Rosalind Haber, a Holocaust survivor, because she never lost hope of finding the person who saved her, and after 65 years of searching, she finally found her. My generation is very lucky because we are the last generation that will be able to meet Holocaust survivors in person. And it is important to remember that every story of every survivor so that we don't repeat history. So congratulations, Matthew. Brianna, Brianna's statement was that I believe that children should be able to come together and coexist without the harsh pressures of judgment and racism. Next one, okay. Emila's statement was that I chose to draw this picture because it shows that no matter your race or color, you can still be loved and appreciated for who you are instead of your racial background. And finally, last but certainly not least, Irana, her statement was the meaning behind this drawing isn't really all that subtle. It is supposed to show a girl helping another girl out after she fell just a simple act of kindness. So I think we can learn a lot from these students and I wanna congratulate all of the winners and all of the students that participated. And finally, the school, bro the school district broke ground on three schools recently. One of those schools has been very long awaited and anticipated in District 3 and I'm delighted to share with you the video of the groundbreakings. Palm Beach County School District breaks ground on three schools set to open in the fall of 2023. School board members and school district leaders all smiles as they move the dirt at a brand new middle school in Western Boynton Beach, a renovated Melaleuca Elementary in West Palm Beach, and a renovated Grove Park Elementary in Palm Beach Gardens. We talk about the new school phenomenon, and that's because it's so exciting. The kids run in, everything is fresh and new, and they can count on the school to be safe, secure, comfortable, well-lit, cool, you know, everything from day one. Construction crews are already on site at the new middle school. This area will soon be home to four state-of-the-art educational buildings to be used by more than 1,300 students. So it's vitally important that we get it right and with the outstanding people in facilities construction who have built many schools and are very familiar with uh, what programs go into schools, uh, we feel very confident that we're going to be providing them with a top-notch educational facility where their, continue, their kids are going to continue to grow academically and socially. The goal is to create amazing schools that are completed on time and on budget. School Board Chairman Frank Barbieri thanks the community for their support of public education. The taxpayers here in this great county have never failed to support the school board when we've asked them to do so, and we thank them for the generosity. The new middle school is expected to be named in the coming months, with the attendance zone process beginning fall 2022. Thank you, and so I want to just end by saying happy summer, everybody. Stay safe and have fun. Thank you, Vice Chair Brill. Ms. Uh, Dr. Robinson, you have comments? You're switching up on us. Okay, thank you. Keep you on your toes here. <laughs> thank you. So I've decided um, to, to um, go back to a previous tradition of mine, which is my black history fact, and I want to um, actually revisit one that I, I gave in 2019 because it's um, appropriate as always. So approximately 20 years now, I, ago now, I proudly visited my oldest son at Hampton University. Us Howard people refer to it as the other HU. Hampton pirates sometimes refer to Hampton as their home by the sea. It's a HBCU which is nestled on the banks of the Virginia Peninsula near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Business majors at Hampton take sailing, golf, and tennis in addition to the hardcore academic courses. All fresh freshmen at Hampton take Hampton 101, the history of the university. So my son proudly took us on a tour of the campus, pointing out many important sites, including Emancipation Oak. The oak tree was first the site where Mary Peake taught freed blacks, mulattoes, and Africans that were escaping from slavery to read. 
Later, this oak tree was the site of the first Southern reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. So note is made that on this Sunday, we will celebrate, celebrate Juneteenth, which commemorates the day in 1865, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, that Major General Gordon Granger landed in Galveston, Texas to announce the end of slavery. Nevertheless, the point here is the importance of knowing your history, how your people contributed. Um, there is a book um, that is called um, Brown's Pillars, which is the, essentially the history of my hometown uh, with the contributions of African Americans outlined. Many of the people in that book are part of my personal story, including my father, my pastor, the librarian that gave me books on my birthday and Christmas, the pharmacist that lived around the corner, and many other professionals and social justice warriors. The second book that I highlighted then, and I want to mention again now, um, is, and I hope it's in every media center, is titled Like a Mighty Banyan. This book contains some of the Palm Beach County story. Of course, it includes S.D. Spady. Of course, it includes Mr. C. Spencer Pompey. And in fact, in that book, I learned that Mr. Pompey was the principal of Washington Elementary in Riviera Beach when he became the first president of the Palm Beach County Teachers Association to provide protective support for black educators. On page 18, they discussed Charles Stebbins at All versus PBC Board of Public Instruction. That case came after the board raised the salaries of white teachers but not black teachers. It was the first class action lawsuit of its kind in the United States and provided part of the legal basis for other suits in federal courts, including Brown versus Board. So it also tells the story of attorney William Holland Sr., the first black attorney in Palm Beach County and the one that sued Palm Beach County schools to desegregate. This building that we're in bears his name. And of course, it, the book tells the story of Dr. T. Leroy Jefferson, the first black physician in Palm Beach County, and the namesake of the local black medical society here. Page 27 includes Dan Hendricks, the first black school board member. They talk about Eva Mack, Bobby Brooks, who were mayors. And I recently received a copy of a document of the history of Riviera Beach written by a panel of citizens. So I plan to share that with curriculum staff. So I say all this to say that I hope that we have finally reached a point where we will have all students research their history, their family, their block, their community, their county, their state, their country, and know that they contributed. Many people have no understanding of the historic greatness, not only of the black community, but other communities in this county, in this country. And there is no um, comprehension as to what happened to it. There's a story there that's informative. I hope that you know about Black Wall Street. I hope that you know and our students know that there were Black Wall Streets throughout this country, including Palm Beach County. When children know the contributions, not only of their ancestors, but the contributions of others, then maybe, maybe then, this country will start to approach the greatness of its promise. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy summer. I had the opportunity to be with uh, school board member uh, Ms. Ayala, as well as teachers, staff, community, and students at the 10th Annual Hispanic Latino Summer Institute, and it was so wonderful. So I've asked the communications department to share it, uh, just a tidbit of it, so that you can get the feeling of what it was like to be there, to see all of our students. Uh, our community, our teachers, learning and growing about the culture of the Hispanic and Latino community. So today, we 
are going to be celebrando the culture, educational achievements, and contributions of Hispanic Latinos that have made a significant impact in our educational system. And it's an amazing event where we bring together community to celebrate the accomplishments of our Hispanic and Latino students and learn from leaders and students alike and see them showcase their talents and through performances. This is so wonderful because it really works with our teachers to help them learn about the Hispanic and Latino cultures. Uh, we highlighted our children. We gave them a voice today. Who are we? Who are we? <laughs> to say, how is the school district doing as it relates to you and your uh, academics and your social and emotional progress within the school district of Palm Beach County. It's always important for us to showcase the talent that we have in our Hispanic Latino community as well as um, to really empower teachers to know how and, and all of our educators to know how to serve the community better. And these sorts of events really bring all that together in one piece as well as just a, a chance to come together as a community and celebrate what our Hispanic and Latino community means to us as a district. What I'm really excited about is the rising voices elevating the Latino stories. Latinos are so diverse within um, our respective cultures. Being able to have materials now available for students to see themselves represented in literature as protagonists is very, very encouraging and it's a step in the right direction so that students find their identity and know that they fit in. Thank you. It was just simply beautiful. A couple of other comments I have for this evening. I'm so proud of the state appropriation of $397,000 for West Technical Education Center for the continuation of the CDL program. This year, West Technical Education graduated 15 adults with their Class A CDL license. That's a big deal. And we're so proud with the $397,000 that we're gonna be able to continue this program and move forward. I want to personally thank our legislative liaison, Rita Solnet. She has been a fighter for West Tech and working through Tallahassee, the legislature, for getting the dollars to get West Tech open and running and doing great things for our students as well as our adults. The state has appropriated pretty close to $3 million over the last few years to get West Tech where it needs to be as we grow and we learn to make a difference for children as well as adults. And West Tech's theme is the place where you learn to earn. And lastly, I want to say I had the opportunity to be right here in this boardroom for the annual Wellness 2021 celebration. It was a beautiful event to see everybody, our schools, our community, everyone working together to keep us all well. It was simply the best. And it gave us an opportunity to thank people like our health department director, Ms. Alonzo, who took us through the pandemic and held our hands to make sure that we were safe, as well as other nonprofits who truly support the school district. Because when we talk about wellness, it's mental wellness, it's physical wellness, emotional wellness, it's all of that. And we were in this auditorium right here, this boardroom, uh, for all of those hours, looking at everybody from all across the community, the schools, the Palm Beach County School District, saying to them, thank you. Thank you for helping our children. Thank you for helping our teachers. Thank you for helping our community. We all want to be well. Wellness 21-22 was a great event, but most of all, the opportunity to say thank you. Thank you. This is Whitfield. 
Thank you so much. Um, I just want to be very brief in my comments tonight. I just wanted to also echo a uh, thanks to Eric Stern. Uh, I have the privilege of, of he used to be my boss. And so it's wonderful to be able to see him in his role currently. He's actually spent the last two years really serving in any any capacity that we've needed him, um, which has been um, as an AP in an emergency situation at Wellington for, I think, six months. So it was a very long time. And then also as um, a team leader for Central Regional Office. So he's really stepped in in every way possible. But the biggest thing, as always, is graduation. Um, I had the opportunity to attend many, many of them this year, and they always go off without a hitch, and they're beautiful. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to his long-suffering wife, Ellen, who's sitting next to him, and uh, that she puts up with us for taking him away for two solid weeks to be able to put on these graduations. We're really grateful to you and your whole family. So just a huge thank you across the board, and I appreciate everything you've done for us. Thank you. Ms. Ayala? None, thank you. Mrs. McQuinn. Mine are short also, and I certainly am not going to be the only board member who does not recognize Eric Stern. So <laughs> I've been on the board now for five years, and in the beginning I'm thinking, why is everyone thinking Eric Stern? I now know exactly why, and it was, everything just went so beautifully this year. My one remark, does reference back to our high school graduations in May. And the word that I was going to use and will use is um, goes back to um, Mrs. Brill's remarks about the Eagles Landing Middle School student who spoke to hope. Because that exact that is exactly what I was reminded of during these graduation ceremonies. There is so much discord and uncertainty in our world today. These graduates were just bursting with pride. They accomplished a life milestone. And you could just see the excitement that they had for the future. And I left every single ceremony saying, you know what? We do have a lot of hope for our county, for our nation, for our world. So on that note, I'm ready to start, not too soon, a new school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. Uh, just got a, a comment also on, on Mr. Stern. Um, he's known out there, by the way, at the fairgrounds as 007. You can hear the officers calling, where's 007 at? So um, I know that Eric has been out there since 2010 because uh, I think that's the year that uh, that I asked the superintendent to, to, if he would assign Eric to that position to he head up the graduations out there, and he's done a fantastic job. And um, he didn't, he told me he didn't know it was a life sentence when I asked him for that. But um, Eric, you do a great job. But the other gentleman that wasn't here tonight that, uh, that the superintendent mentioned is Sergeant Sal Longo. And uh, Sal's a great guy, and he retired last week, so we won't be seeing him at the graduations anymore. But he was 007's right hand man out there. and. Uh, just a little bit about Sal. He was uh, he served in the Army for four years before he was uh, with the New York Police Department for 20 years, and he actually was at uh, he was at Ground Zero on the day of the attacks on September 11, 2001. In which case he was um, he suffers still suffers from from that day uh, medically uh, on his health. So we wish him a great retirement, and I wish he would have been here tonight so that the superintendent could have taken a picture with him. But uh, congratulations to both of you for a great job done, and, and uh, we hope that, uh, Sergeant Longo, you're, you have a long, healthy, and happy retirement. Uh, on a sad note, we have um, four people that have passed away from our employees, and at this meeting we normally recognize those, so I'll go through those. Uh, Gina Bof uh, Beauford, she was a behavior or physical needs assistant at Boca Raton Middle. She was born in January of 1965, and she died in April of 2022. Marissa Fontaine was a teacher at Village Academy. She was born in August of 1962. She died May of 2022. Robert Heber was a teacher at Lakeshore Middle. He was born in September of 1957, and he died April 2022. Tamar Wisdom, she was a teacher at Grassy Waters Elementary, and she was born April 1958 and died in May of 2022. And one other one that's not on my list, but I found out today that Dr. Alina Alonzo's mother passed away recently, Dulce Maria Welch, so we send our condolences to 
her family as well as the families of those other four individuals. So if we could just have a moment of silence for those um, families. Thank you very much. And last, before I, we move on, is uh, today, as I understand, is the instructional superintendent elementary for Region 5, or for, for the South Region District 5, which is Jamie Wyatt. So happy birthday, Jamie, if you're here anywhere. She's right there. Happy birthday. And uh, Dr. Sheffield's birthday is tomorrow. So happy birthday, Dr. Sheffield. That'll take us to committee reports. We have academic advisory committee. Are you reporting tonight, person? Audit committee. Mr. Doctor, are you here? Construction oversight review committees. There, there, there's uh, audit committee is not doctor, uh, doctor, uh, Mr. Doctor. It's all, uh, he's with construction oversight review committee, and his report is attached to the agenda. The District Diversity and Equity Committee, are you here to report? General Council report? No report. All right. All right, we have the Inspector General is with us by phone, but she has no report to give us. So that'll take us to elected officials and delegates. We have four. So please come up to the microphone when I call your name. Uh, James Gavrillos, President and CEO of the Education Foundation, Jen Martinez uh, from the Florida PTA, Claudia Kirk Bartow from Junior Achievement at Palm Beach Treasure Coast, and Erica Gustafson, Palm Beach County PTA PTSAs. Good evening. Board members, Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chair Brill, Mr. Burke, thank you for allowing me to be here again, and thank you, James Gavrillos, for letting me go first this time. That's quite an honor, and I'll just congratulate him for Leadership Palm Beach County Excellence Award, so you can all congratulate him as well. Um, I am Claudia Kirk Bartow, the President of Junior Achievement of the Palm Beaches and Treasure Coast, and Proud to support the teachers and students in Palm Beach County Schools as we wrap up the school year, Junior Achievement, get ready, it's a big number, has served 63,727 students this year in Palm Beach County in about 1,800 classrooms. Kindergarten through 12th grade programs have, have been delivered by over 650 volunteers this year. And this means that our local students have received over 170 thousand hours of instructional support from volunteers in our community to prepare those students to succeed. But this year, most importantly, I want you to know that Junior Achievement has provided over $1.3 million in support to the Palm Beach County School District. That's $1.3 million that we give to the school district each year. Did I say $1.3 million? That's a lot. <laughs> of support that we give through um, partners in the community um, and the grants that we write. And we're also excited to announce our new 3DE school directors for both William T. Dwyer and Lake Worth High School. So former principal, Palm Beach County principal Reggie Myers will be joining 3DE at Dwyer High School in the fall and his expertise will be a welcome addition to launch 3DE at Dwyer as well as Yinka McAlpine. She's joining us as our 3DE school director at Lake Worth High School, and she comes to us from the 3DE school over in Pinellas County as their math coach. So she's very familiar with the programs, and we just look forward to growing those programs within the community, and happy summer, and everyone be safe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Bartow. Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, Superintendent Burke, and members of the school board. Uh, it's the summertime. We theoretically slow down, and supposedly it's about surfboards and beach balls, uh, but it's not. Uh, your education foundation is hard at work. Um, in two weeks, on the 27th of this month, we gather for our annual strategic planning session. We take the entire staff, and we kind of burrow ourselves in a conference room for six hours. Members of the school board, you would be welcome to join us and, and give your insight. We do a strategic plan for the entire year, we plan the work, and then as they say, we work the plan. And I think that's one of the reasons for our success in hitting these numbers. 
I want to highlight three programs tonight. One to wrap up our Red Apple Supply Year. Uh, this year we distributed $1,464,067.58 worth of school supplies, which is an increase of 23.8% over the previous fiscal year. We had 2,350 teacher shops, which is a 76.3% increase over the previous fiscal year, and we're now serving 76 schools, which is an increase of 20%. Again, these numbers don't just happen in a vacuum. We do the work in our strategic plan, and then we make sure that we follow through. And as you met the staff two weeks ago, you know that they'll hit these goals. Uh, we can only imagine what next year will bring, and again, I encourage anyone who is interested to join us for our strategic planning session. The second piece I want to share tonight regarding our Go Teach grants, a program uh, hopefully everybody knows well. Happily, teachers, if you're listening, the application process is live tonight. Please go to apply.educationfoundationpbc.org and you will be able to apply for a Go Teach grant. Uh, this year we awarded 90 Go Teach grants, totaling about $176,000 with funding from the Consortium of Education Foundations, the DeLuca Foundation, and David Nicholson with the Stiles Nicholson Foundation. So teachers, please go on that uh, website right now, apply.educationfoundationpbc.org. Principals, help us get the word out to your faculty so we can do what we do best, which is give away more money. Uh, Chairman Barbieri, uh, do you have one more truck trip in you? Sure. We want to introduce uh, the, the district to a new partner, Truist, uh, the new bank, which is a combination of two banks that merged. They reached out to us through the Miami Dolphins. They wanted to do a volunteer effort. We've connected them to our backpack initiative. School board members, I, I, these numbers continue to just grow and stagger our mind. Four years ago, I think we did three or 4,000 backpacks, then it was five, then it was six. This year, we were already at 10,000 backpacks to be distributed to about 20 different schools through our backpack initiative. We're now up to 10,600. Truist reached out to us and said, we've got a, an event and we're going to have some volunteers. We want to pack up the backpacks for Palm Beach County. I said, great. How many volunteers are we talking? And they said, somewhere between 400 and 1,000. And I had one of those astro moments. I went, ruh -roh. Um, We're doing this down at the Miami Convention Center. We're going to truck all the supplies down to the Convention Center. And somewhere between 400 and 1,000 employees of Truist are going to spend that day packing up backpacks for Palm Beach County. Superintendent Burke, I think this says volumes about your leadership and this school district, that 1,000 truest employees in Miami want to serve Palm Beach County. With all due respect to my colleagues in two other counties that they're going to bypass, they want to help this county because they see your professionalism, your dedication to the young people, and they want to make it happen right here. So we want to welcome Truist uh, to our family of champions. Again, we thank you, Chairman Barbieri, and this school board for all your support. We are your education foundation, serving the needs of the students, teachers, and schools in the finest school district in the state of Florida. Thank you. You, you haven't lived until you've ridden with James in that big box truck going, going down to Miami, I'll tell you. It's, it's a great experience. Just let me Some drive a truck should. every now and then. I'm a happy man. <laughs> Thank you. Jen Martinez or Erica Gustafson? All right, if they're not here, we'll move to agenda topic speakers. Um, I'll call you three at a time. Please come up. Uh, whatever order you get there is fine. Um, Albert Konigsberg, Don Pearson, and Christopher Sharp. Thank you for inviting me this evening to speak. My name is Albert Koningsberg, and I'm a subject matter expert and the COO at Layers and Legends, a public safety company based in Boca Raton. The Layers and Legends geographic information platform integrates with a wide range of technologies on the market to address public safety, such as door access controls, metal detectors, video surveillance, and panic buttons. PBC Schools has purchased some of these assets already. However, these assets are not as effective as they could be in an emergency situation because there is no way to visualize and track all of these assets together under one common operating picture. 
or the largest gap is presented in the MSD Public Safety Commission report. Layers and Legends interactive map interface provides emergency responders with a cost-effective, near real-time, in-building, campus, and county-wide situation awareness. This will enhance response times to man-made and natural disasters, maximize response efforts, and most importantly, help save lives. Preparation. Layers and Legends digitizes critical in-building information collected before an event. The technologies are scalable by design from a single school to an entire school district. Mitigation and response. The platform provides a secure way for the school administrators to share accurate information with school resource officers, maintenance personnel, utility companies, local and state fire police, EMS, and provides the ability for first responders to share this information with one another. A unified incident command and control system, as was identified in the MSD Commission report, a major gap for a coordinated, effective response when multiple agencies and personnel are involved. Layers and Legends is actively pushing towards integrating with the latest technologies on the horizon in order to provide responding agencies with the ability to rapidly identify and share active threats and hazards en route to the scene. With artificial intelligence and gunshot detection, the perpetrator can now be identified upon entering the campus grounds and tracked. Thank you, Mr. Konigsberg. And that is uh, FPSP1. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Don Pearson and Christopher Sharp. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chair uh, Brill, and Superintendent Burke. Uh, before I start, I'd like to, I've been here the last three days, and I'll be here tomorrow uh, at um, the financial boot camp that Aaron Standish is putting on. And I just want to tell you, you guys have a gem in Aaron. He, he, is, he is amazing. And I want to say thank you to uh, Superintendent Burke for reaching out uh, and corresponding me, with me. You didn't have to do that, and I really appreciate that, and I thank you. Um, but talk about uh, retention, and uh, recruitment and retention. If you have every first-year teacher take his boot camp, I guarantee you people will stay in this profession because it is great. So that brings up P1. Uh, the reason I come up here and talk about the separation of uh, employment for some teachers that I think are on a list uh, and should be vetted more, I want to keep that in the forefront because you are the gatekeepers of making sure things are done the correct way. And unfortunately, I also see that happening on a smaller scale with coaches on a local level to where some people who have the power will take a coach and say, I don't want you coaching anymore and just do it, doing it for no apparent reason and that hurts them financially even when they're doing a good job. And I'm, I'm seeing that happen and it kind of pains me a little bit because some of them don't deserve that. And I just want to make sure that you're aware of that we need to keep people in, in our schools. And we have, just like we were talking earlier, there's a whole lot of great teachers. I just finished my 40th year. I love this county. And I've stayed here because I've had a lot of good people help me. And I'm watching some teachers and coaches not get the help. And I just want to say to the uh, gatekeepers here that you have that ability to make sure that uh, all you know, all the key players do what they're supposed to do. So that's why I keep it in the forefront. And um, every year I do it, and I just want to make sure that uh, we, we don't let anybody get away. And uh, the reason I'm here 40 years is because I don't want to get away, and I want to keep good people. And I know uh, you're, you're, the, you're the group that can really keep them. Just, let's just vet a little bit better and 
let's help those young teachers so they stay by getting them in here and saying, hey, financially, we're going to help you out, and then they'll really, it'll, it'll be a better community. So I thank you. One more thing, a little self-serving. I, I, I like sharing a birthday with good people, so today is my birthday, so I want to say happy birthday to you. Gemini's are great. <laughs> happy thank birthday, you. Mr. Pearson. Thank you. Christopher Sharp, Diana Fetterman, Jen Showalter, and Micah Desiante. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, I'm Christopher Sharp. Uh, first, I want to thank the board and Mr. Burke for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I'm a board certified labor and employment attorney and I'm speaking on item P3, specifically the proposed uh, transfer of assistant superintendent, Diana Fetterman, who's my client. Um, I know that this is part of, part of a, a group of personnel moves and the superintendent obviously has the prerogative to make these types of moves at the end of the year. But the particular transfer proposed for Ms. Fetterman is, is one that you really should pause and look at and we think disapprove. Um, first, it's styled as a transfer. It's actually a demotion in the sense that her salary is going to be redlined if she takes the new position. It's paid from a grant. That will have a significant impact on her retirement. She's a couple years from retirement now. Under the FRS system, if her retirement uh, is frozen now, if her salary is frozen, she's going to lose probably close to $10,000 a year on her pension. So that's the personal harm to her, obviously. But the reasons why we think the board should not approve this, um, this, this particular proposal is twofold. First is it has a high potential to result in litigation. Um, I submitted a brief timeline, or a brief timeline of some facts um, that I hope you get an opportunity to read. Um, but Ms. Fetterman has had at least three incidents in the last six months where questions have been raised about things she has said um, that are protected under the First Amendment. Uh, the first one I mentioned in the outline was up in Tallahassee. Apparently the superintendent was up there in January. A tweet that she had written was brought to his attention by a legislature who didn't like it and sent it on to the governor. Um, she withdrew that tweet, um, but then she was placed on the committee to determine how to implement the new house bills, and that's where the problems really began. We put in the outline how at one point, she questioned a decision by Mr. Tierney to remove a couple of books from circulation before the standards for making that determination had been implemented. Um, and that same day, she sent an email to the superintendent where she opposed his decision to remove a graphic from the sex education curriculum. And under state law, that cannot be done. That way it has to be approved by the board. So, so we, we think that basically her, her, her uh, transfer was proposed within a couple of days of that. So, so that seems to be the main reason she's being transferred. On the other hand, it's also a terrible idea for the kids. This is the person who's in charge of implementing the new curriculum standards for next year. And my wife's a teacher in Broward County. I know this is a big change. She's got a lot of work into this project already. They've suddenly taken her off it. They don't have anyone to replace her with her level of experience. The people that are ultimately going to be harmed by this decision are the students of, of the district because they're gonna lose the person with the most expertise on curriculum. So, so we think that the timing of the decision should definitely give you pause in the events leading up to it, but the impact on the students is the primary reason why this just seems to be an ill-advised decision at this time, and we hope you will disapprove it. Good evening. My name is Diana Fetterman. Our district has a saying, if you don't tell your story, someone else will. Well, I've decided to tell my story in three minutes. I'm a product of Palm Beach County Schools and have dedicated 27 years to this district. For the last five years, I've had the honor of serving as the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning. This position frequently requires 12-hour days, weekend events, phone calls and emails at all hours, but it is my dream job and I love it. And I'm good at it. During my tenure, we have seen increases in accelerated programming. We've written and opened new courses for state adoption, increased academic achievement, adopted high quality instructional materials, earned numerous grants, and engaged with community partners at a whole new level. So why the proposed demotion? Not because of my evaluations, they're fantastic. Not because of my job performance, no problems there. Not because there's some need for my talent elsewhere. This new position is being created now and holds no current responsibilities, projects, nor team to lead. And it's certainly not because my current position is obsolete. 
The district is preparing to implement new standards, new textbooks, and new assessments across literacy and math, in addition to reviewing the entire curriculum against new legislation. I am currently leading that work and guiding 11 direct reports. What is the plan for continuing that work and leading those team members? So why the proposed emotion? It's simple, because I'm a vocal ally of the LGBT community. When senior leadership proposed a, a computer search for any library book tagged LGBTQ to remove them for review, I pushed back, citing First Amendment rights and court precedent. When I suggested we start reviewing some of the books the district had already pulled to determine if they could be returned to library shelves, I was told they would never go back, even though a review required by board policy never took place. When the superintendent directed me to remove the gender-bred graphic from the 12th grade board-approved curriculum, even though that violated district policies, I expressed my concerns. A few weeks later, I was notified of my proposed emotion. This is retaliation, and it's a pattern. Questioning the superintendent isn't permitted, especially by a woman. Though I may be the first to present my story in this forum, I am not the first victim of retaliation. The number of women who offered to provide a deposition for me is astounding. I don't want to be here today. You know me. You know this type of public outcry is not my style. I had no choice. My hope is that this ends tonight and I can return to my current role and keep advocating for our children. But if that isn't the case, I keep fighting. Someone has to. Hi, I'm Jen Scholter, mother of three, including Sydney Scholter, who just graduated valedictorian in Wellington High. Sorry, I had a proud mom moment. Um, but as a mom of a student at the Wellington Community Mar High School marching band in the trumpet section, I know all the details about the London trip. This is a very prestigious opportunity for our county. The city of London issued an exclusive invitation to participate in their New Year's Day parade. However, the cost is $3,500 per student. As a mother of a special needs student um, in that band, I would not send him halfway around the world without one of his parents. That means an additional $3,500. Uh, other parents are needed as chaperones or may need to attend due to um, issues with their own children. That means that all students must pay out of pocket or fundraise that money and then add on an additional for the parents that act, uh, equals $7,000. That isn't feasible for many of the students. The school district does not pay for bands, sports teams, transportation to any competition throughout their seasons. Students have to carpool, fundraise, or they don't go. That needs to change. I would suggest that one of our school, uh, our districts gets, if one of our schools, district schools gets an opportunity of this caliber, that we should, that highlights and spotlights our, our county, that we should do everything that we can to support them. And if that means uh, giving them a little financial boost, I think that's something we should be doing. Um, whether it's going to nationals for robotics, sports teams going to states, or marching bands and musical groups going overseas. Uh, this is an opportunity to show parents, students, and staff that students come first instead of pet projects and contracts that are redundant and unnecessary. I'd also like to talk um, about, as a mom, as a varsity athlete, uh, I'm a little concerned about the certified athletic trainer issue. Uh, the board let go all of the trainers during COVID, and I'd like to ask why we were going to need them back. Uh, we had a great relationship with ours, but he ended up having to go to UPenn to get a job. The board used the premise of personal relationships to defend their position on the school board resource officers, yet disregard the more intense relationships between a, a trainer and their students. They know that John has a sore rotor cuff on his left shoulder and needs to get it checked out. Susan knows that she can trust Mr. Doe about her injury. Um, so we need to make sure that we talk to coaches and athletic directors before making any changes. Uh, policy 5.735, Parents' Bill of Rights, um, that should be very clear. Follow the law. The board has already issued letters against it, and the track record for following directives from Tallahassee is extremely poor. The board has also needs to be honest about the actual bill, which I have right here. Um, it in no way discriminates. It just provides communication and transparency for parents. It states... Oh, 
Well, you can read the bill. Thank you so much. Micah, Micah Desiante, Erica Esch, Lucy Caputi. Go Good ahead, evening, ma'am. Superintendent Burke and members of the board. My name is Micah Desiante, and my pronouns are he, him. I am a teacher in this district, a parent, and I am also a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Despite my reticence, I felt compelled to speak on behalf of my students, past and present, to ensure that they may never have to feel the way that I did when I was eight, invisible, confused, and ashamed. As such, I am here to address the implementation of House Bill 1557 in Palm Beach County Schools. First, let me thank you for unanimously denouncing this hateful, misguided, and discriminatory bill while it was going through the Florida legislature. It is reassuring to know that I teach in a district that affirms LGBTQ people like myself, especially at a time when we are literally under attack. While it might seem easier to retreat, we must continue fighting to protect our queer kids now more than ever. Proponents of this legislation might have you think that the LGBTQ community has some sort of perverse agenda, that we are indoctrinating kids or wanting to groom them to be gay. That is preposterous. Our so-called agenda is quite simple. Keep LGBTQ plus kids alive and well. We already know that queer kids are at a significantly increased risk for suicide. The eight-year-old version of myself can assure you that that statistic about suicide and LGBTQ plus youth is quite real. We have to do everything in our power to let our queer youth know that we see them, that we support them, and no matter what, we will protect them, not in spite of who they are, but because of who they are. It is our duty and responsibility to protect the children and families we serve, despite what this law says, and more importantly, what it doesn't say. While the law is problematic for its inherent and obvious discrimination toward LGBTQ plus people, equally disconcerting is the ambiguity with which it is written. As a teacher, I am terrified about how this legislation can be manipulated to target me and my colleagues, but as a parent, I am horrified at how this law could be weaponized against LGBTQ plus families and their kids. Because this law uses conflicting language, it does not delineate what is age appropriate. I need you to interpret this law in a way that protects teachers and our students. Let's use the ambiguity of the law to our advantage. We need to create policies that are unambiguous as they pertain to this legislation, policies that continue to protect queer kids. We must also maintain the policies already outlined in the district's critical resource guide for LGBTQ students. Members of the board, I implore you to take into consideration the seriousness of this policy as you prepare for implementing this unfortunate and unconscionable law. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lucy Caputi, and I come to you today as a concerned citizen, former public school student, taxpayer, and LGBTQ community member and advocate. As school districts across the state are forced to draft policy in accordance with House Bill 1557, I'd like to ask what the Palm Beach County School Board, school board will do going forward to stand by their equity statement. What does it mean when you say you will not change or weaken our commitment to affirm all students by ensuring a safe and nurturing learning environment? What does that look like? In terms of how this school board will enact this policy, how are you willing to mitigate the absolute cruelty this will cause? Are you even aware of that cruelty? And are you aware that regardless of DeSantis, it's still going to be a mark of shame on you? We know this law isn't founded on anything real and is part of a coordinated attack across our country to vilify LGBTQ people and justify hatred. This law will not change the actual lived realities of students and educators or somehow magically make gender and sexuality disappear. I implore you to consider how this will negatively impact a significant percentage of students and faculty you know for a fact are in your districts and what can tangibly be done to protect and support them under HB 1557. Thank you. Erica Esch, Alexia Martinez, Rory geller Mohammed. Faith Halstead. Tonight I would like to begin with addressing the children of Palm Beach County directly. Hi to you all. My name is Erica Esch and I'm a resident of Lake Worth, a non-binary comrade to these very powerful and compassionate youth 
leading and taking a stand against the approval and complicity of harms promoted in policy 5.735 Parents Bill of Rights. To the youth of this room and beyond its walls, I hope you feel proud of yourselves, each of you, for committing to learning and striving, living and experiencing beyond the pressures presented to you by the social and political, economic, environmental, and individual grievances of our day. You're seen and very rewarding to take and share time with, mobilizing for human rights in support of the LGBTQI plus POC BIPOC identities we are here today to celebrate and protect. You are a conscious and loving generation calling so much attention to social injustice despite political disqualification on the basis of age and development. And we are here to support you throughout this process. Being as the youth are the designated recipients of our education system and its policies, and being as these policies allow the perpetuation of oppressions, it may not always feel like we each have a seat at this table, this table called power. But as students and educators, we are entitled to know they are students themselves with people within them, growing people who have certain entitlements to human rights beyond the status quo curriculum of a given political regime. We have the human right to disagree with the exclusionary, anti-democratic, exponentially unsafe and delegitimizing rhetoric about ourselves and classmates. We have the right to develop discourse surrounding our own education. We have the entitlement to basic reproductive and sexual health education in public schools, as well as the mental health resources and the exploration of experiences of human development generally that could help us mitigate rape culture, homophobia, transphobia, eating disorder, self-harm, and abuse. It will not happen by not mentioning it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Faith Halstead. I was born and raised in Palm Beach County, and I'm here today as an L LGBTQ plus person, undergraduate student, and mental health worker. There are numerous issues I would like to touch on today, primarily that of policy 5.735, the Parents' Bill of Rights. This legislation is hostile and exclusive. We are not only limiting the minds of our children, but for some and for many, we are erasing critical parts of their identities, whether it be their own or that of their families. Honest and accurate education is not only essential, but it is our children's right to receive such. This legislation, its harmful intentions and products are not only a massive disservice to your community, but they will make it even more challenging for the marginalized to receive the care and recognition they not only need, but are entitled to. We are reinforcing the implications of this legislation through other acts, such as those that are banning books, once crucial to inclusive education. I'm aware we have already pulled three from our shelves, and I'm here to ask you, Superintendent, to reconsider your actions. It is frightening to me, as someone who considers raising children in this county to have to take into account the hindrance these bills place upon our youth. As someone who has worked in mental health and recovery facilities throughout our county, servicing young adults of all backgrounds for nearly three years, I also consider the effects this bill will undoubtedly have on our community's mental health. We are creating an ill-looking space for our children, one in which their education will not grant them the right to be comfortably themselves, to exist outside of heteronormative identities. In an environment that already lacks promotion of accurate LGBTQ plus rights, historically and currently, this legislation is guaranteed to restrict what should be a safe and honest educational space for all children. We have the ability to give the youth of our community the space to grow with full awareness of themselves and their identities, as well as the identities of their families, their neighbors, their teachers, and the rest of their community. This will not be the last you hear of our concerns. We will continue to fight for the rights of our youth. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Have a good evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Rory Geller Mohammed, and I'm here today as a mom of two young kids, as you can see. One going into VPK, and the other is going into second grade at Coral Reef Elementary School in West Lake Worth area. I'm also here as someone who has worked as a school social worker, as well as a licensed therapist for many years with youth and families. But I'm here today because I want you to really take into consideration what policy 5.735 and the Parents' Bill of Rights and how we protect and support the LGBTQ community. I'm here because I not only value the diversity of our kids, but also know how important it is in child development that kids feel seen, understood, and supported. 
This includes our children that identify as LGBTQ+, as well as those who have parents, family members, and friends that identify that way. When our kids don't feel seen, understood, or supported, that is exactly when we see mental health issues rise, like depression, anxiety, and way too often suicide. By not prioritizing the safety and well-being of LGBTQ plus students and families, we are not only putting their lives at risk, but we're also preventing all kids from receiving an education that prepares them for real workforce and navigating these issues of diversity in the real world. We have an amazing opportunity in front of us as a community to model for our kids what it looks like to teach understanding, love, and kindness, and what it looks like for us to live in harmony in a community full of diversity. We have an opportunity for our kids to see characters in books that have different like, life experiences in them, as well as opportunity for kids to see families that look similar to theirs. It's an opportunity where we can support our LGBTQ plus students and families, and know that at the same time, all of our kids will benefit from a more safe, loving, and inclusive educational setting. Most of us as adults can look back to a time growing up where we felt left out or excluded. We can likely recall the feelings that brought up, like embarrassment, shame, sadness, anger, and just an overall feeling, a painful feeling. Why would we want any of our kids to feel like that? By removing books that have LGBTQ plus representation and preventing teachers and staff from talking about identity and the LGBTQ plus community, we are creating an environment that is painful and harmful. I ask you as a school board and school district staff Please use your power to create an educational environment that prioritizes understanding, love, and kindness for all students, including the LGBTQ plus community. When we prioritize our humanity over our differences, we all get to win. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alessio Martinez, and I am currently a um, high school student in Palm Beach district and I am currently going to be a senior start of August and I also identify as trans and this parental rights bill has made me very concerned about the way my teachers in which they have expressed extreme homophobia and transphobia within the classrooms are going to take it as a way to try and silence some of the LGBTQIA student voices when we speak up against them. And I really want you guys to really analyze what the bill says and help and train these teachers as to weigh and what they can and cannot do to us high school students. And we really need support and we need understanding that Republican lawmakers are going to continue to keep attacking us. And we definitely need support from the school board members. Know that we, you have our back and that you will support us students and that we do not need to support like we don't need we need support from all over and I know there's people in that room that could not care what I have to say could tell me that I am confused but at the end of the day this is not going to stop me from being who I am this is not going to prevent queer students from not existing outside of the classroom we are here we exist and we deserve to be heard we deserve to be represented whether it's in books posters in classroom discussions we deserve to be heard Thank you for your time. Amanda Kennedy, Sonny, and Kai. Hello everyone. My name is Amanda Canetti and I'm a Palm Beach County resident. I also work for Compass Community Center and I'm our Youth and Family Services Director. And I'm speaking on the Parent Bill of Rights. Our school should protect all students and respect all families, including LGBTQ students and families. Policies like the Parents' Right Bills would force schools to violate that most basic trust. Palm Beach County needs to do what is right, no matter how hard that may be. We are not going anywhere. There are young people that came to share their experience today. Please listen to what they have to share. This bill is not just about removing a few books and stopping meaningful conversations happening in classrooms, but it is intended to erase a whole community. Palm Beach County Schools 
have no place for complacency when it comes to LGBTQ students. Thank you. Hi, hello. Okay, deep breath. Good afternoon, my name is Sunny. I'm a youth who's a part of the LGBTQ plus community. And I'm also a high school graduate. And I'm someone who really strives to be a teacher. Being a teacher is a dream job of mine. I love working with kids and I love teaching. And, I'm, and I love teaching a major passion of mine, which is art. And lately, as I've been observing the news regarding Florida, Florida's bills, this dream of mine has been put in jeopardy. One of Florida's bills, the Don't Say Gay bill, silences LGBTQ plus voices within the classroom setting. It rips away representation from children and forces teachers to conform to a cisgender and heterosexual label. All of this under the guise of ensuring children don't quote unquote become gay or quote unquote become transgender. This idea of this bill being put in place is terrifying for me. I have spent 14 years of my life hiding and I have spent 12 years being bullied within the public school system for things I cannot control. And I am not the only student that has a similar story. Most of my queer friends, most of my transgender friends have similar stories and I am not the only one and that is heartbreaking. I am LGBTQ plus and I had to claw my way to allowing myself visibility. The idea of having to yet again hide something so innate about myself because it could harm children is something that makes me sick to my stomach and terrified. This lack of representation did not prevent me from becoming gay or becoming transgender. It merely put my life at stake and that is not an exaggeration. Classmates viciously bullied me, called me slurs, and ostracized me. Cisgender heterosexual te teachers had no idea how to support me and even said things that further isolated me from other children. I needed a teacher that was like me. I needed to know other kids were like me and I needed other kids to realize that trans and queer people exist. I am not an oddity that should cause you to hide your children from me. And I'm not going to go into a profession that will force me to relive those years of ostracization and bullying. The school system has failed me every single time and I don't want it to fail other kids like me. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Kai. I am a junior in the um, in the public school system. Um, I I want to show you my perspective of how I've gone through the public school system so far. Um, I I am scared to walk into school every single day, and I am lucky, and I hate thinking that I'm lucky, but it's it's true. And what I mean by I'm lucky, I mean I have faced the bare minimum that every queer student in the public school system has to face. The bare minimum being verbal harassment and some, <laughs> being verbal harassment. And I, the verbal harassment that I have faced so far this year is like, I've been barked at in the hallways. Um, people have laughed at and mocked at me, strangers that I don't know. And I've also had unconsensual uh, videos and photos taken of me with the possibility of cyberbullying following that. It terrifies me. Um, out of the 50 plus cases of harassment that I have um, experienced this last school year, I can only recall one that was actually resolved and resolved being the harasser was caught and punished. And the typical punishment is detention. While my punishment, I have to continue to go to therapy. And a layer of fear is added to the wall of fear that is already there. Um, almost all of my friends, um, all of my queer friends have have shared their experiences with um, sexual assault, rape, physical assault, and so much more that I, I can't even think of. Um, something else that I don't hear much about, and a huge topic, is, um, is about like depression, suicide, and self-harm. The Sweet 360 lessons sh uh, show us how to identify when people need help, but it doesn't show us that most of the time, um, people struggling with depression seem the happiest. Um, we're... <sighs> The amount of times I have heard suicide jokes is not okay, and none of us are taught about these suicide rates and how bad it actually is. Personally, I didn't know how bad it was until this past school year when I had to do a, um, a research project on, on the LGBTQ plus community. In 2019, a study done by the CDC reported that 23% of LGBTQ youth attempted suicide compared to the 6% of cisgender and straight youth. 
Around 73.1 million is the current um, population under 18 in the U.S. 6% is around 4.4 million. 23% is 16.8 million student, uh, youth who have attempted suicide in 2019. This scares me because even though it was 2019, which was only two years ago, it's, it's, it's not that long ago. And especially with the censorship of education that is going to continue, um, there was an education on the LGBTQ community in the first place. But the censorship that will continue will continue to encourage these rates, and I'm scared for the future. Thank you for your time. Emmy Kenny, Max Fenning, Ray Whiteley. Hello, board members, Superintendent Mike Burke, and district staff. Talking to you too. My name is Emmy Kenny, and I am once again here to speak on behalf of LGBTQ students in Palm Beach County Schools. You just heard testimony today from some very brave students who unfortunately are not the exception, but the rule. LGBTQ students are not safe in your schools. They experience bullying and harassment on a daily basis oftentimes so bad that they have to withdraw from public school, and sometimes so bad that they would rather be dead. Nearly half of LGBTQ students or youth nationwide contemplate suicide, they really consider it, nearly half, 45%. And schools play a huge role in, in what that number really is. An affirming school environment can reduce the amount of suicides of LGBTQ youth by 40%. 40% could be prevented by an affirming school environment. So what does that look like? Well, when we pull LGBTQ books off the shelves, when we take it out of the curriculum, when we force teachers to hide their identities, when we fire or demote advocates for LGBTQ youth, that school environment is not affirming, and it makes it dangerous for LGBTQ kids. It's as simple as that. Now, I understand that you're going to adopt this policy today to be in compliance with the law. I've accepted that, and a lot of people have accepted that. But you have the opportunity to make up for the harm that that is going to cause by implementing some new policies uh, bare minimum, I would say, is teacher training. You heard what these kids said. Teachers, you know, they want to support their kids, but they don't know how. And I will say, as a teacher, I very, very quickly realized that my colleagues needed training, and it took me two years to get Pete Stewart into that building to give them that. It should be required. It should be embedded in every training they do. The suicide prevention training that all teachers did at the beginning of the year, not one mention of transgender students. And the two sentences about gay students were offensively outdated. So let's start there. And there are existing policies that protect and support LGBTQ youth that are not prohibited by this law. So let's implement those. There are so many policies that are good for our kids, but they're not being followed up on. They're not being implemented. If you're going to pass this policy, you have got to mitigate some of the harm that it is going to cause, because it will cause harm. Thank you. Hello, my name is Max Fenning, and I'm the founder and president of PRISM, an LGBT nonprofit that works to expand access to LGBT inclusive education and sexual health resources for young people in South Florida. I don't need three minutes to tell you how sad I am to be here. I don't need three minutes to express how much it pains me to know that in Palm Beach County School District, the same school district that uplifted me time and time again as an LGBT student at Boca Raton Community High School, they gave me the privilege of seeing myself and my community in the classroom everywhere from history lessons to health class, a mirror like the one I looked in to do my hair or brush my teeth before coming here today with sticky notes that say you're okay, you're valid, there's nothing wrong with you, and you'll make it to see the next sunrise. That even here, policy 5.735 sits on the agenda. 
I don't need three minutes to explain how this policy on a red and white sheet of paper is vague enough that it serves as a red and white target on the backs of so many of the students and parents you sit on this board to serve. But I don't need three minutes to remind you of all the ways that you've stood up to, for those same students and parents with conviction against bad science, discrimination, and injustice on everything from mask mandates to LGBTQ plus critical support guides. And I don't need three minutes to urge you to do that now. To stand up with the same conviction and firmly planted feet, to draw a line in the sand and say enough is enough, to refuse to allow your support to fizzle out, to understand that if it does, LGBT parents and students will not fizzle out. We never have, we never will, but it will be that much harder to stay afloat. We've come so far. I have come so far because I saw what LGBT inclusive education could look like, education that let me step into my own, that propelled me all the way to Tallahassee three separate times on seven drives against this bill just for our government to look me in the eyes and take that away from so many young LGBT people that will follow in my footsteps. So what makes me so sad is that in the state of Florida, I don't need three minutes, I need years. I need decades that so many gay men don't have to tell stories that make you feel the hurt, the heartache, the awe, the confusion, the hope of being a queer person in this district. And so I urge you, feel that in these three minutes you've given me, in the three minutes of so many people here today, and hold that close when you vote. Thank you. Good evening, peace and blessings to you all. My name is Pastor Ray Whiteley and I am organizer for Faith in Florida, Palm Beach County. The mission of Faith in Florida is to build a powerful, multicultural, nonpartisan network of congregations and community organization in Florida that will address gun violence, voter suppression, systemic racism, economic issues that cause poverty for our families and to help build a beloved community. We represent over a thousand congregations in 37 counties in Florida. Not only am I an organizer for faith in Florida, Palm Beach County, I am a pastor. I am an immigrant living in Palm Beach County since 1982. I am a father to eight black children and a grandfather to 14 black grandchildren who I bring with me into this space. We, along with Common Purpose and its partners, are collectively fighting for a strong, equitable public schools where students receive an honest education about our history, read books that accurately represent their experiences, and get the resources and support they need so they can work together and across differences to tackle our country's greatest challenges. All children, especially my grandchildren, deserve an honest and accurate education that enables them to learn from the mistakes of our past and help create a better future. History shows that when we work together across our differences, we accomplish great things for ourselves, our loved ones, our neighbors, and our children. I also stand in solidarity with the Volunteer Association and their efforts to increase the number of administrators and staff on school campuses with a high population of Haitian students and support their South intensive campus renovations. Those are my written um, thoughts, but I had to be here tonight to be in this space. I wanted my voice to be heard in this space because I think this is a moment in time that we will remember in Palm Beach County. I was supposed to be at our track practice with eight of my grandkids, eight of them, but I chose to be in this space. Hopefully they will see this recording and they will be proud that I stood up for them and their education. Thank you.
Maria Cole, Pranu Kumar, Jackie Nearing. Good evening, everyone. I'm here, my name is Maria Cole. I'm a resident of Palm Beach County. I'm an investor in public education, both in sense of community, my tax dollars, and everything else. I stand before you with common purpose in solidarity with our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters, our faith leaders, our union members, members of the black community, to demonstrate to you the power of what it looks like when we all come together. I came before you to speak on behalf of this parents' rights um, issue coming before you tonight. And I feel like it's important that you know that there are trans parents, there are gay parents, there are black parents, there are immigrant parents, that all of this impacts, that you have to take into consideration that we all come to public education as the foundation of what it looks like to build community in Palm Beach County. And please, please do not cause harm to any one of us, because when you do, you cause harm to all of us. Thank you. These are just a few of the banned books. My name is Pranu Kumar, and I am a proud immigrant daughter of Konkani immigrant parents, a mother of a powerful 18-month-old and another eight-week-old, and an early childhood elementary educator rooted in the liberation of education for all. I own a social justice-driven children's bookstore and learning center in West Palm Beach, Florida, where every single book is reflective of historically marginalized communities, black, indigenous, Latina, Pacific Islander, Asian, Arab, LGBTQIA plus community, neurodiverse community, and the disability community. Being seen and heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are indistinguishable. I love you, I care for you, they say. We are here to protect you, they say. But your story is not allowed. There will be no images of you. It's not traditional. There is something wrong with you. You don't belong, but I love you. I will protect you. It manifests. Then as you get older, it affects you, socially, emotionally, mentally, until the day you try to commit suicide because you grew up surrounded by systems not meant for you. So you don't feel like you're meant to live. This was me. But I refuse to let my two children feel this way, too. We will stand for liberation. The pages of a book can transport us, lift us, acknowledge us, identify us, inspire us, literally keep us alive at times. Our ancestors work too hard. This is for the communities that have been without place to breathe in fullness, yet full we know in power. Our children deserve to see themselves. They matter. They belong. Racism, discrimination is a public health issue. It causes murder, murder, death. Listen to our children. They are humanity in its purest form. I read this book because we're supposed to be opening up worlds, not erasing them. Papa, Daddy, and Riley. Papa, Daddy, and Riley. On the first day of school, my parents walked me to my classroom. My friends were being dropped off by their families, too. Olive was with her mom and dad. Molly was with her mom. Hector was with his grandma. Luke was with his foster mother. I was with my dads. I love you, my little princess. I love you, my little dragon. When the bell rang, I hugged Papa and Daddy goodbye. I love you, Papa and Daddy. Hi, Olive. Hi, Riley. Who are they? Those are my dads. You have two? But which one is your dad, Dad? And where's your mom? Well, they're both my dads, I answered. My belly mommy doesn't live with us. One mom and one dad make a baby, and that makes a family, said Olive. So which dad is the real dad? I was confused. If a family only has one dad, did I have to pick one? Was I Papa's princess or Papa's dragon? So this book right here has been banned. A beautiful book. 
please don't do this to our children. Board members, I've called the names of all the, the agenda speakers. There's a lot of non-agenda speakers yet to speak later. Um, is there any item that any board member wishes to pull from consent at this time? Ms. Ayala? Uh, no, never mind. Sorry. I'm sorry. Ma'am, did I call your name? You did. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and speak. Sure. Hello, my name is Jackie Nearing. I'm the program director at Inspire Recovery, one of the only LGBTQ recovery centers in this country, right here in West Palm Beach. It's an honor. I also serve on the board of Transpire Help, a local nonprofit that serves and provides resources to the LGBTQ community. I'm a member of the LGBTQ community. I have a master's degree in social work. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I'm certified in trauma-informed care. I have been serving the transgender community for the past five years. Day in, day out, I have served hundreds of trans and non-binary individuals. With this experience, I have a personal responsibility to educate everyone in this room and every professional who provides care to our youth. And that's why I'm here today. Over the past five years, I have learned from this community about this community. I didn't learn from cisgender people. I have come to understand the developmental process of gender diverse young people. I have learned that gender identity develops between ages three and five years old. I have learned that our current system of assigning gender at birth is not accurate for all people. I have learned that gender identity is not sexual orientation and there is nothing sexual about gender. We all have one. I have learned that assigning the wrong gender at birth and raising people the wrong gender is actually traumatizing and detrimental to one's sense of self, with a capital S, sense of self. Based on what we know about trauma and how it affects the brain and brain development, it's evident that raising people the wrong gender causes deep injury to the psyche. The brain goes into a fight, flight, freeze, fawn response, and the learning process is disrupted. What heals the trauma of being raised the wrong gender, you ask? It's simple. Affirming the authentic self with a capital S. You want to know what affirming means? Here's the short version. Affirming can be viewed as not just accepting, but ensuring that individuals can be their authentic selves, use their authentic name, their real pronouns, and encourage authentic gender expression. What happens when people are not affirmed? exactly what this policy is trying to implement, self-harm, isolation, anger, depression, anxiety, panic, maladaptive ways of coping, and ultimately suicide. This policy is directly harming LGBTQ plus young people. This policy is affecting people K through 20, not K through three, what I've been, people think. Right? This policy will absolutely contribute to youth suicide. We demand that you keep our LGBTQ plus young people alive and please educate yourselves, your teachers, your faculty about gender diversity and more ways to be affirming. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Ayala. I see it's already been pulled, thank you. There's no other items to be pulled. We need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. We'll take us down to new business. Public hearing item, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, yes, this is for information purposes. There's, there's no recommendation here. The subject for this public hearing item is our dual language Haitian Creole language arts instructional materials for kindergarten units uh, in first and second. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, zero, one, and two for future adoption. Right. There's no vote needed. This was just to make this available to the public tonight. Okay, Ms. Burrell. Thank you, excuse me, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask the superintendent, um, how are we letting the Haitian community know? Are you putting anything out to them? We're speaking to Haitian radio. Just announcing it in this meeting, I don't think is sufficient for reaching out to them. Uh, this is our standard notification process that's required as part of our policy and statute. Uh, the, let me check with Mr. Oswald here if there's any additional measures. Good evening, board members. 
The multicultural team has also gone out to a number of <coughs> places of faith. We've held meetings with certain organizations. We've, they've been a part of the process since the beginning. Just as a follow-up, um, are we sending, no, I mean, I know it's a little unusual to reach out in that fashion, but because so many of the families don't speak, uh, speak English, um, are we sending out any notices in Creole or anything? Yes, we, okay. we've worked with um, different organizations to get the word out so that we get community input on these okay. materials and then working with the particular vendor we are. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. I just had an opportunity to speak to the Haitian community uh, just a few days ago uh, in working with our superintendent uh, with some of the contacts. Uh, this is the kind of information that he will be going on the television to talk to the community. I just had the opportunity to do it a few days ago. And working with our superintendent, he will be actually on the television uh, making a presentation to the community just about this, plus in addition to the things that you're doing, Mr. Oswald. All right, if there's no further discussion, BRD2. I recommend the board discuss and take any action needed to rejoin the Florida School Boards Association effective July 1st, 2022, and that the superintendent and board chair be authorized to take all appropriate action to implement the board's decision. Motion by Ms. Ayala, seconded by Mrs. McQuinn. Discussion, Ms. Ayala. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to kind of go over some information that our team put together um, at the request about this organization. And I think that we all recall less than a year ago, we made a unanimous decision to part ways with this organization based on highly offensive commentary that their leadership made, after which FSBA did nothing in response, continued to let that individual serve in a capacity of leadership. And I don't need to get into that because we all know what happened. We all remember being highly offended. And we all remember this room being full with our community partners asking us to take that decision. So now it's less than a year later. I have personally not seen any improvements in their space. And then when reviewing our legislative priorities and how they have compared based on our requests and their support, I'm finding gaps. Um, we all know the priorities that we put forth for our legislative team to go up to Tallahassee and advocate for. Um, some of that last year in particular after the pandemic brought some new requests from us based on what we've seen in this chamber, much of, it, much of which has been harassing, unacceptable, and offensive to all of us sitting up here. Um, FSBA did nothing to support us as individuals. FSBA allowed members around the state to continue receiving threats as bad as being reported to DCF for child abuse of their child, did nothing. I have personally not heard from the leadership of this organization, nor have I seen their investment or concern in coming to me as a representative for a Hispanic community, their board chair offended, not only with her comments, but with her service on her own school board, and say, let's have a conversation about it. I am not interested in rejoining this organization as an individual, and I'm not interested in voting to support spending $30,000 of our money to join an organization that has not lived up to the standards that I expect of this body when we make equity statements that say the things they say. I cannot do it in good conscience, and I'm just, I can't even understand how we're here at this point. I understand that we have budgetary timelines, but there is no reason that we have seen that they have changed their tune or that they are prepared to support us. And one, one last thing I want to say is that when I had a call with the executive director and explained to her in detail the sexually laced, offensive, hateful, threatening, literal item of mail I received at my home while being a board member and trying to do my job to protect the kids of this district, she just had nothing to say. So I cannot support this. Um, I am not going to speak for the organizations that were offended by what they did, which includes many members of our LGBTQ community sitting in here with us, asking us to stand up for them. And I cannot, in good conscience, support this by any means. Ms. Ayala, um, pursuant to Robert's rules, if you made the motion, you can't vote against it. So you want to withdraw the motion and let somebody else? I withdraw the motion. So this person that seconded that motion was Mrs. McQuinn. 
Do we have a second on Mrs. McQuinn's motion? You, Mrs. Mo Mrs. McQuinn, do you want to make the motion? I do want to make a motion with the understanding that there will be discussion. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll do whatever you need. You need a second on that? Ms. Brill, you, are you second in the motion? Okay. No, Under discussion, Ms. McQuinn, you're first, and then Ms. Brill. Making sure I do this correctly, I would like to um, propose an amendment that we postpone this agenda item because it does require discussion, and right now our focus needs to be on items that need to be handled to open school August 10th. I'll second. And I'll second. I was going to second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Mrs. McQuinn to, to postpone this until after August 10th. And I second. Correct? And it's been seconded by? Lots of people. Three of you. Uh, I'll just pick one. Ms. Brill, it's been seconded. Let's discuss the motion to, to table. Ms. Brill? I just wanted to bring something to everyone's attention, which um, I don't know if everyone saw it, but we received, and, and I support what you're suggesting, we did receive an email from um, Father Frank, who was the founder of the Guatemalan Maya Center, um, where he was suggesting that, um, we, that they were rejoicing in us um, standing up against those that balk you know, and, and basically challenging and making the change at FSBA by making our voices be heard. I completely agree with waiting. The other thing, though, that I want to mention is that we do have the ability to individually um, go back and join if we choose to. Um, I did read over their priorities. I had no problems with any of them. I don't think we should have the same priorities. I think we have more voice when we have multiple. But as you may recall, I did not want to join the Greater Florida Consortium of School Boards. And so, you know, I've stepped out of that. So I think we should postpone it. But then I think we should also think about if we want to individually join, because that would um, give us the opportunity. I tend to, when, when confronted with, dif with differing opinions, I prefer to try and hash it out and find some ways to make change. Um, that's just my approach. But I certainly understand the need to postpone. All right, on a motion to postpone, we can take discussion on a motion to table. There's none. It was a motion to postpone by Ms. McQuinn. So any other discussion before we vote? Ms. Ayala? Yeah, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. And as a member of the marginalized community that was offended by this, I'm not interested in being somebody's workshop on how to be what I expect them to be when they say they represent school boards around this state. They're not doing the work. They're not showing me they want to do the work. So this is not about me not wanting to pitch in and be a team player and say, let me make you better. But that's not my job. I thought they were supposed to support us, not the other way around. So until I see investment from them on their end, and I hope that their executive director is watching and listening, I cannot in good conscience tell two communities who are standing, standing with us here today, this organization said all these things and looked the other way when you were being offended, didn't support the people trying to support you when they were being harassed, but we're going to go join them again less than a year later. When we make decisions up here, it has to mean something. It hasn't even been a year. And we're going to say we can flip-flop our decisions because we just, it's time again. It is not enough. I'm sorry. Mrs. McQuinn. Are we discussing delaying this for another date after open of school? Yes. Yes. There's no other dis Marshall. Mrs. Andrews. And I really don't want to bring it back while I'm trying to get school open. I mean, when you start talking about getting the children back to school and, and focusing on the teachers, I mean, I can't see us bringing this back right in the middle of opening school. Uh, personally, I, I felt uh, exactly the way uh, Ms. Ayala feels because uh, it was a terrible thing the president and the executive director did uh, as it relates to all children. You heard all these speakers talking about treating uh, children with respect tonight. And we took that stand here because the, the racial discrimination, the heartbreak uh, that was uh, lashed out at children was awful. And I think the school district of Palm Beach County as a board, we did the right thing to step back because we don't want to be a part of any of that. 
And as I look, I see they're making some, some changes, but they're not, I'm not there yet, and we can actually uh, decide what we want to do when we come back. I don't really need another discussion. If all of us want to join, when we come back together again, away from the opening of school, maybe in October or November, fine. But I'm not interested in uh, taking the time during the opening of school to hash it out. If you want to join on your own because you've done your research, uh, and you feel that's what you want to do, and I appreciate the letter from the father, but uh, I've been doing some research, and I'm certainly not ready to get back up in there until I know that uh, some major changes have taken place. Dr. Robinson? Okay, so I suppose the motion to postpone is debatable because we're continuing to talk, right? Because I was just checking. Okay, so... Let me just tell you, I, I won't, whenever, whenever it's on the agenda, I'm not going to support it. Um, you know, I participated in the Florida School Board Association and National School Board Association. I was bitterly disappointed with both, right? I don't consider them to be advocates for children. I think that they, um, and from what I understand, the Florida School Board Association is um, moving further away from the positions that I would take for children. And so I'm like, I was just gonna vote it down. I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's some reservation, but I mean, it was after dealing with them that I found the Council of Gray City Schools. Now that's an organization who fights for children. That's who I'm here for, so, no. All right, let's vote on the motion to, to this is a motion to postpone it until sometime after August 10th, this the beginning of school, so all in favor? Opposed? That motion carries 7-0. COM1, Mr. Superintendent. I recommend the board proclaim June 2022 as the month for the 10th annual Hispanic Latino Studies Summer Institute. Motion by Ms. Ayala, second by Mrs. Andrews. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Pardon me? Oh, yes. So I'll go ahead and read it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Whereas in 1998, the Florida legislature enacted required instruction for students to learn about Hispanic contributions to the United States, and whereas in 2022, the school district of Palm Beach County Office of African American, African, Latino, Holocaust, and Gender Studies will host its 10th annual Hispanic Latino Studies Summer Institute, or did host, and whereas the goal of the Summer Institute is to provide professional development to help improve cultural competence among district personnel and assist in the development of effective and relevant instruction, and whereas the Institute helps develop an equitable learning experience for Hispanic Latino students in Palm Beach County, which helps improve academic achievement, and whereas the Institute helps ensure that there is a shared commitment and collective responsibility for the academic success of Hispanic Latino students, and whereas the Institute provides multiple historic and cultural narratives to help enhance the understanding of Hispanic Latino history, ethnicity, culture, identity, and language, and whereas the Institute celebrates the culture, contributions, and educational achievements of Hispanic Latino students, and whereas the Institute helps promote a positive, supportive, welcoming, and inclusive school climate for Hispanic Latino students, now therefore be it resolved that the Superintendent and School Board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim June 2022 as the month for the 10th annual Hispanic Latino Studies Summer Institute and commends the achievement of infusing curriculum and instruction with instruction and information about Hispanic contributions to the United States. Done this 15th day of June 2022 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you, Ms. Ayala. That motion passed 7-0. The next item, Mr. Superintendent, is COM2. Yep. I recommend the board proclaim Friday, June 3rd, 2022 as National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Brill. Mrs. Whitfield, I understand you want to read that proclamation. I do. Thank you very much. Um, for everyone in the, pop in the um, audience, I just wanted to let you know this is something we do every year, and though it's very timely, I think it's very important that we, that we read this right now. Um, this is the proclamation for National Gun Violence Awareness Day, June 3rd, 2022. Whereas Americans are 26 more times times more likely to die by, die by gun homicide than people in other high-income countries, whereas Florida has 200, 
2,849 gun deaths every year with a rate of 12.9 deaths per 100,000 people. Florida has the 27th highest rate of gun deaths in the United States. And whereas gun violence prevention is more important than ever as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to to exacerbate gun violence after more than two years of increased gun sales, increased call to suicide and domestic violence hotlines, and an increase in city gun violence. And whereas in January 2013, Hadiah Pendleton was tragically shot and killed at the age of 15, and on June 3rd, 2022, to recognize what would have been the 25th birthday of Hadiah Pendleton, born on June 2nd, 1997, people across the United States will recognize National Gun Violence Awareness Day and wear orange in tribute to Hadiah Pendleton and other victims of gun violence and the loved ones of those victims. And whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Hadiah's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange. They chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves <clears throat> to other hunters when out in the woods and orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and to help keep our children safe. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and the school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim the first Friday in June, June 3rd, 2022, to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day and encourages all citizens to support their local community's efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence, to honor and value human lives, honor and remember all the victims and survivors of gun violence, and declare that we as a country must do more to reduce gun violence done this 15th day of June, 2022 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you very much. Favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. And I understand Wyna Dunmire is here. If you would come up to the board clerk at the end of the dais, she will give you a copy of that proclamation that's been signed by the. Thank you. Thank you. COM3, Mr. Superintendent. I recommend the board proclaim June 2022 as the month for the 28th annual African, African American, and Caribbean Studies Summer Institute. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Ms. Ayala. Mrs. Andrews, I understand you want to read that proclamation. Yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Proclamation 28th annual African, African American, and Caribbean Studies Summer Institute, June 2022. Whereas in 1994, the Florida legislature enacted required instruction for students to learn about the history of African Americans. And whereas in 2022, the school district of Palm Beach County Office of African, African American, Latino, Holocaust and Gender Studies will host its 28th annual African African American and Caribbean Studies Summer Institute. And whereas the goal of the Summer Institute is to provide professional development to help to build capacity among district personnel and assist in the development of effective and relevant instruction. And whereas the Institute is designed to help educators, educator, educator, educational leaders, parents, community stakeholders identify and implement practices that can improve academic and life outcomes for our African American students. And whereas the Institute provides the template that promotes an inclusive climate and culture for African American students. And whereas the Institute celebrates the cultural and historical contributions and educational achievements of African Americans. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim June 2022 as the month for the 28th annual African African American and Caribbean Studies Summer Institute and commends the achievements of infusing curriculum and instruction with the culture and historical contributions of African Americans to the United States and the world. Done this 15th day of June, 2022, in West Palm Beach, Florida, 
Frank A. Bobby Airy Jr. Esquire, Board Chair, Michael J. Burke, Superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Pursuant to board policy, uh, we will break the agenda at this point and take non-agenda speakers for one half hour. If we're not done with the non-agenda speakers by 7.30, we'll go back and finish up the agenda, and then we'll get to the rest of the non-agenda speakers at the end of the meeting. We have currently have 24 non-agenda speakers. I'll call your names. Please come up to the podium. Remember, you have three minutes, and state your name, please, when you come to the microphone. Brother Carl Muhammad, Ezekiel Emmons, and Lowell Levine. I'm um, Brother Carl Muhammad, and I'm here once again to say, um, well, happy Juneteenth, although I know that many times we don't understand the dynamics of what that kind of suffering is all about. And as we continue to look out for our children the way others look out for their children, never do I hear anyone mention our children and their particular problem. And I, I wanted to bring you greetings from the, they say it was 50 million that we lost in the Middle Passage. But as we continue to move forward, the state task force, I don't know if y'all really know it, but the state of Florida's task force for African-American studies is going on today and tomorrow. And I've asked them if they would consider treason um, for those who have knowledge about the things that will prepare for our children and you're not following them, um, the, your, your equity and wellness, your, um, none of that stuff with, with the three superintendents that we have to deal with. None of them have reached out to our community. None of them, and even with your equity study, it said that 60 or something percent of your teachers didn't know our children at all. And I hear tell now that you're getting ready to do a great employment, and I know that you don't have nothing in place to assist them. And that's the reason why we tried to partner with you as a community, because we do have that skill set inside of our community. Now, we understand that it's a fearful conversation, just like you have with the LGBTQ, BTQ, or anybody else, and when it comes with, to dealing with the problems of those of us who are the children of the slave, you got a bigger problem. But I can assure you that we don't expect you to do nothing because it's 28 years, and if you go out, out here and ask anybody in here, they still don't know that that law exists. So I'm going to go back to the task force, and I'm going to try to bring, um, some, I know it's a new law, well, it's a new concept of thinking, and treason is when you betray people. And my community have been betrayed for 20-some years. I can't go nowhere. People don't know that the state don't apologize for slavery. They don't know um, the Florida statute has been passed for the benefit of our children. None of that stuff. And they don't believe me coming to the community. Or let's have this conversation where our, our community can have uh, input directly on, the, on what you decide to do. And I've been reaching out to everyone on the, on the board to try to get some kind of clear direction for our children. If you could just tell us some of the improvements that you've done this past year, because we went through the pandemic, the epidemic, and all the rest of that stuff, and no one still is talking to our community. We have heard nothing. I mean, I've heard everybody's children mention the night, but ours. And we, we deserve the same kind of um, conversation like you hold with every other group of children. Our children, uh, the African American, the descendants of the slave, we deserve that right and we're going to demand it, and we're not going to demand it from you, we're going to demand it from myself, but that non-monetary foolishness that I heard come from um, the board, um, I think, I know it's wrong, and I know um, we ain't really asking you for no money, we're just asking you to show us the opportunity for us to share some new information with you about our children. Thank you for your time. Ezekiel Edmonds or Mr. Levine? Six foot four, so I got to raise it a little bit. <sighs> Good evening. My name is Lowell Levine. I am the founder of the Stop Bullying Now Foundation, organized in 2012, tax exempt organization. And uh, I am very proud of the work that we are doing because we save the lives of children that are being bullied. Uh, not only here in Palm Beach County, but the state of Florida and across the country. We've handled over 2,000 students so far in the, the, the 10 years, and we have been uh, very, very successful. A child is precious. A child is priceless. 
The biggest concern that parents have today here in Palm Beach County School District is they send their child to school in the morning and they don't feel there's any guarantee they're coming back that afternoon. The situation here in Palm Beach County for the 2021-2022 season has gotten worse because I have received many more phone calls from parents who have not been getting any success at the schools with the principals or the administrators. But that increase has been caused because I've gotten involved with a new group in town called Moms Group, which has 14,000 members, and they are very much concerned about the future of their child's safety in school as well as their education. I would say that 50% of the children that get bullied are lesbians and gays and special needs. I help them all, I work with them, and I do whatever has to be done to save the life of the child and prevent the lifetime destruction of the family. If the school board wants to know how successful I am and why I'm successful and how I can implement it here through your organization, you can call me and I'll be happy to meet with you to explain to you my game plan and why these things are taking place and why it's getting worse and why the mental problem of these children that are being bullied are getting worse. And it is known that 100% of all mass shootings in this country are done by children that have been badly bullied because they became mentally ill. You only know about a few of the mass shootings in this country, but there have been 138 since January 1st. And last month, there was one almost in Washington, D.C., where six children were shot. But the shooter, the student shooter, was on the roof across the street from the school in a high-rise building, shooting away. Thank God he was a bad shooter, so they got up there in time. Otherwise, they claim he could have killed at least 30, 40 kids coming out of the school at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm here for you. If you want to save these children's lives, call me. I'll meet with you, and I'll tell you what the game plan is, and I'll explain to you how you can help the parents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Dwight Walton, Corey Walls, Karen Moran. Good evening, board. Good evening, Mr. Superintendent. My name is Dwight Walton. I am a retired Florida Highway Patrol trooper. I did 27 years. After retiring in 2007, I initiated my own business. We do the electronic fingerprinting, drug testing, background screening, processing, investigative. 2017, the Early Learning Coalition is the organization that disseminates the funds for VPK. I contacted the district myself and advised them that the change is coming through HR. HR advised me that the district got an exemption. Come to find out the district did not get an exemption and they had to be in compliance with being screened under DCL. Unbeknownst to me, a memorandum went out on May 1st, 2018 and October 19th, 2020. The uh, memorandum came from the purchasing department. The, the subject matter is direct negotiating with fingerprint, mobile fingerprinting LLC out of Fort Lauderdale. I'm a member, of, I've been in Palm Beach County since 1980. I've been a part of the district since then. The uh, purchase department is in a, a, nego a direct negotiation with fingerprint, mobile fingerprint LLC. This firm has been identified as an FDLE, FDLE approved vendor for fingerprinting services that meets the state minimum screen, um, screening through the Early Learning Coalition. I have a copy of both letters. I have a copy of uh, FDLE's list. Mobile fingerprinting LLC is not on the list. They're a third party provider, which means when they submit, it submits to a national company, which is field print out of New Jersey. Here I am certified with the district, the state of Florida and Palm Beach County as a minority small business. I didn't even get a call. When 
2018, the budget, the budget amount was 60 to $100,000. 2020, it was $75,000. I brought it to the district attention that I am a vendor certified with the district. When I got my PO, it was $22,000. The board made a decision on May 11th to allow mobile fingerprinting, field print, to facilitate the screenings that the police department is no longer uh, satisfying. Nobody called me, but soon as the drug test went out, I got two different emails from two different departments stipulating that the drug test is available. When the fingerprints went out, I heard nothing. And nobody wants to give me, as a small business certified in the district, the opportunity to perform the services. Mr. We, Walton, I'm sorry, but your time is up. Yes, ma'am. We have this, the fingerprints for DCF side. We already in the district doing work. And nobody thank, wants to thank you. Want to extend the time? Frank, they want to extend the time to let him speak. Ms. Sanders, you want you want to make a motion to extend the time? No, I just wanted to make sure through the uh, the chair to the superintendent that somebody go out and spend some time with this gentleman so that we can uh, investigate what he's talking about and make sure that we haven't done something that we should not be doing. So if somebody can check on that for us, I'd appreciate it. I will have staff follow up. Uh, I'm a little familiar with the situation. We have not done anything wrong here, but we, we will hear the gentleman out. And there's some more s circumstances around this whole decision and our needs to uh, to move the fingerprinting, you know, out to outsource that. But we'll follow up. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, Palm Beach County leadership. I'm Corey Walls, a teacher at Atlantic Community High School. I came here tonight to talk to you about a subject that no one wants to talk about, death. For the past three years, we have been inundated with death around us. 5.2 million children across the globe have had their parents die from COVID alone. But even before COVID existed in Palm Beach County and around our country, we had children mourning the death of their parent or caregiver. We really never had an idea of who those students were or what they were struggling with unless it was shared with us by word of mouth by the surviving parent or student. In 2019, I started a program for grieving students called Steve's Club. I named it after my own father who died at the age of 30 from cancer. I was eight months old. This program helps grieving students have a support network to navigate the grief, trauma, life skills, and academics that suffer as a result of the loss. Just at Atlantic High School this year, we had 79 students identified by word of mouth. If we extrapolate that number out, even at Atlantic was an outlier, out of 192 schools in the district, each school having an average of just 10 students experience this type of loss, we would have 1,920 students needing support. If we're being more realistic and say on average each school has 40 students, half of the amount of Atlantic's number, we still have 7,680 students grieving the death of the most important person in their lives. Next school year, nearly 20 schools in our district want to implement Steve's Club on their campuses. These schools have come forward saying the need in the community is great. Educators see the academic, emotional, and financial toll kids face after losing a parent or caregiver. However, they don't have the tools or time to devote to help the way many want to. This is where Steve's Club comes in. Steve's Club is after the initial shock, a continuous support through the student's K through 12 academic career, well after outside people forget or make light of the child's loss. The death of their parent or caregiver is still very real to children for the rest of their lives. They may look fine on the outside, but many are still hurting, especially without proper support. Steve's Club is an intervention that can be easily implemented into each school to support the unique needs of grieving children starting with updating SIS and registration forms to include deceased as an option for parents, creating an icon for teachers to see in SIS, to train teachers in grief sensitivity so they know how to address grieving students in all stages of coping with the death. 
and to assist growing Steve's Club as a program available to all schools in our district. And I can tell you, every student who participates in the program goes on to college or trade school. We are the 10th largest school district in the country. Programs like Steve's Club don't exist across the country. We need to set the example for the state and the country that grieving students do not need to be ignored anymore. I'm asking you to do something bigger than yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Moran, Quinlan Stewart, Adrian Smith, and Ashley Labad. Hello, my name is Quinlan Stewart. I'm an LGBT, uh, part of the LGBT community and a graduate of, of public, private, public charter school. You don't want the school experience to be ruined by LGBT curriculum, but my school experience has been tainted forever. There are so many things those other kids call me that I was convinced I didn't deserve to be alive. The number of days I'm terrified to go to school outweighs the, day the days that I'm not. If we could teach at a young age that being transgender or being queer is okay, maybe I wouldn't have lost as many friends as I have. Anonymous, age 14 to 17. Does this sound like the schools that your kids are attending, that you're teaching? I'm speaking on the policy 5.735, the Parents' Bill of Rights, which claims to be protecting students, and yet, what about the 80% of parents who have said yes to comprehensive sex education in schools? Or the 40% that encourage discussions of LGBT uh, situations in these classes? Or does their opinion not matter? This new bill that is being proposed requires reporting LGBT students unless they are considered to be in danger once they get home. And yet this bill is being pushed by people who will not accept their LGBT kid if they walk through the doors. I hope you realize that LGBT, sexual orientation, gender, these are protected classes. So if we go forward with this bill that allows people to be able to pull books off of shelves and change the curriculum, let it be an eye for an eye. If you gain any, uh, ban any discussions of LGBT parents, ban all discussion of any parenting. If you ban books for LGBT romance, ban all romance. This is equality. It is, this bill is discrimination. DeSantis has been concerned about the sexualizing kindergartners. So in going forward with that, are we also going to be regulating school uniforms, cutting out any t-shirts that say ladies man, chick magnets, daddy's little girl, anything that's pink or blue or tie-dye or has rainbows? Because of course, these things are perpetrating the gay agenda as it exists. And speaking of books that are banned or being proposed to be banned, let's talk about, for example, Tango Makes Three. It is about a penguin, two male penguins adopting a baby penguin. Are adoptive parents nest, next? Cross-cultural parents, are they next as well to be banned? We are blinded to a non-issue. There are other things that we need to be working on to protect our children. Thank you. My name is Ashley Labad. I just wanted to refer to last meeting when I was called out on record and put on record that I wasn't just giving numbers, Mr. Burke, for charter school, it was also public. It was just in my speech. Um, there is word tonight that people were paid to speak. I'm just curious if that's true. Another item on the agenda was a Berlin trip. I want to know why, who is meeting, what is discussed, how much, and what is the goal of it. I know I can't afford to go to Berlin. Also, the trip to LA next month, apparently first class trip. We're not supposed to say board member's name. The other thing is the panic button. I know you guys have discussed this, however, as a teacher, I can tell you that I feel like this button is going to be pushed and then you are going to have emergency workers show up at schools and then now you only have wasted money but you have wasted getting to other people that need them. Um, people do not go into places that are armed. A lot of the schools that are being attacked are public schools. 
They do not go into these private schools because teachers are armed. There was talk about training in Florida to have armed teachers and not being discussed. A lot of people making the decisions have never even shot a gun. So that's something to think about. There's also parents that have contacted me about uh, the board telling them there is one entry point for schools, and I know that's not true because I've worked in many schools. There are a lot of companies that you all are donating to. We would like more information on that, where every dollar is spent, because as we have seen, we have a lot of um, people that are suffering from mental health, and the money should go to those students. Um, it seems that propaganda is working. Um, what if we united this is what they do not want? A teacher seeing students as humans and equal is what they are supposed to do. If they don't, they should not teach. In my classroom, everybody is welcome. They are all human. Politics and sexual orientation should not be discussed in schools for anybody, whether it's straight, gay, whatever. It's just not a place for the classroom, and it hasn't been since I grew up in Palm Beach County. If they need help, they can go to counselors, but we need more counselors, I can tell you. Ours is overloaded. A real teacher is there no matter what and believes that she can talk to he or she or they can talk to their students and be open and listen to them. If they can't do that, they should not be there. But nothing needs to be pushed on anyone. Middle schools and high schools are mean. That's how it goes. I was bullied. Everybody's been bullied at one point. Um, I have LGBTQ members at my school, and for us, we just look at each other as human, no different. Uh, I'd like to quote, um, workshop to be what they expect to be. I will not be anyone, just me. That goes for anybody, no matter who they are. And great city schools do your research. Soros funded. Nazis. Karen Moran and Adrian Smith. Go ahead, sir. Greetings. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I've heard a lot of comments this evening about equity and about uh, uh, fair treatment, equal tr treatment, respecting children. And uh, this is why I'm here. The topic that I have to discuss today is about, um, first of all, security, and also for professional, uh, compassionate relationships between uh, faculty and parents and faculty and students. What's your name, sir? Adrian Smith. Okay, thank you. And <clears throat> the reason for my coming here, first of all, I uh, was recommended by someone in your district to come forward to you to present uh, my concerns as a parent. I have two teenager boys uh, that are in school, and uh, we had a uh, uh, quite a few years of a lot of issues of security. And one of my main concerns about that is the fact that, um, that there is a lot of violence, that there is drugs in school, uh, there are crimes taking place in school, and I've complained about this for many years, and I've had a sense of complacency, not uh, necessarily that they don't care, but a sense of complacency uh, with regards to a lot of this, uh, things that take in, uh, place in bathrooms, a lot of times there is a lot of crimes that take place and so uh, I have brought this up, and um, at one point I was told that we know it goes on, but unless we have a name, there's nothing we can do. My, uh, one of my boys says I can smell marijuana in the school. Uh, then one day my son was skipping class because he did not want to go to class, and he's not a very good student, my younger boy. And, uh, and then when that happened, he was um, confronted by uh, two children that came in and had uh, sexual intercourse in one of the bathroom stalls while he was there within a matter of whatever it was, seven minutes. And I was outraged about it. In fact, it struck a chord in me, which uh, caused me to protest uh, about security uh, at the schools and the issues that are taking place. And I was uh, approached by a hostile uh, uh, administrator of the school who had told me that uh, uh, I had better leave the campus uh, or that he would uh, have my ass kicked in jail and uh, a number of other things. Robert Hatcher is the person of name. Uh, very hostile person, uh, very disrespectful, 
and uh, I'm here to complain about it and to, to, to make known that, that, that um, these are issues that are real and that something needs to be done about it. Now he has filed a lawsuit because I've complained about his misconduct uh, for defamation, which I think is outrageous. Uh, he was hostile and he uh, was abusive towards my son. He was abusive towards me. He called my son names. He accused him of things that he was found not guilty of by the school police. Mr. Smith, your time is and up. And so I have brought this complaint up to you before, and I'm bringing it up today, and I'll have more follow-up on this. All right, thank you. We have time for one more non-agenda speaker before we have to go back to the agenda at 7.30. Edward Niesenbaum, you're next on the list. No, not, not two. Well, I have time for one speaker. So if you want to uh, pass both over, you can go to the next one if you want to wait. Go ahead, Mr. Niesenbaum. My name is Edward, and I finished fifth grade with a lot of academic achievements signed by Brandon. Let me share with you my opinion about fifth grade reading materials. Almost all books are woke motivated or direct propaganda against nuclear family. I don't want to read suggested books for my book project, so I did it based on Rush Limbaugh book. My class liked it a lot, and I received the highest grade. I got very upset when my teacher was reading Broken Strings by Eric Walter. Book stated that Jewish religion was forcing people to get married without consent. It is ironic that during the Holocaust Awareness Month, woke board like you is pushing anti-Semitic agenda. For your information, Jewish law prohibits encouraging, incur, prohibits marriages without consent. Even opposite, young couples are encouraged to know each other better. I told my class and teacher about this misinformation. And she stated that nothing she can do board first for, forced her to read this book. My request is to add the Tuttle Twins series to elementary school curriculum. I already gave 12 books from the series to Barberry. Did you read it? I would like to volunteer and introduce these books to education committee. It is time for Palm Beach County students to start reading interesting books instead of woke propaganda. I want to share one more news with you. My tennis sparring partner from New Jersey informed me that he was starting to play tennis as a girl. He's three years older, and now he can win almost all the tournaments, and he will get free college eventually. As a bonus, he can pick at half-naked girls in the lockers. My mom contacted his mother and will provide more information. My statement is, as a future man, husband, and father, XY chromosomes, I will not allow any pervert to disrespect and violate privacy of our girls, future wives, and mothers, double X chromosomes. I will fight any attempt from the board, school, or any individual. I am ready for civil disobedience. Mr. Superintendent, the next item on the agenda is DS3. Yes, I recommend the board approve the vendor agreement with career source effective July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2027. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Discussion? Dr. Robinson. Yes, I just um, <clears throat> want an understanding why it appears to me from going from Amendment 2 to Amendment 3 that we decrease the number and the variety of career pathways being provided via career source. So am I misunderstanding or misreading? Mr. Tierney. Mr. Fred Bartsch, welcome. Okay, so the uh, new agreement with CareerSource, uh, what we did is we cleaned up a lot of the programs. When we originally did the CareerSource agreement three years ago, we listed every CTE option that we might be able to offer in the future. In reality, what we did is we cut out those that we are not offering and just the ones that we are currently offering or will be offering in the future. And we had to do that because then we were getting calls on programs that we were not offering uh, and it created some confusion. So this is a much cleaner document with everything that we are currently offering and we can amend it at any time to include additional offerings. Okay, all right, so you, you you know, you know me. So you quieted yeah. me with the amendment part because I, I don't, to me, this feels like lowering expectations. And I also didn't see any construction trades on there. Did I miss that? 
No, there right now we don't have construction trades. Our construction trades are funded by the state. Okay. So our pre-apprentice programs are free. There is no cost to the program, so we have no benefit. There's no uh, funding that Career Source would, would fund us for. We, we have that completely funded. And last question. And so Career Stores Source is still not able or willing, whichever the right word is, to um, help us with career programming such as this for our students in alternative ed? They would have to leave and go to adult ed? Yes, and that's a state rule, uh, not, not a career source rule. We, in order for funding, or at least our adult ed funding uh, to be used, it has to be students 16 or over if, and, and withdrawn from school, uh, that's, or adults. So they cannot be a current secondary uh, student. Okay, and so I'll be done by just asking Mr. Superintendent if you would just look at that because um, there are high school students that could benefit. I mean, the case in point is Riviera Beach Prep with the North Tech program right there. They could easily take advantage and and it's our children in, a, in alternative ed that most, we most need to give these career opportunities to. My understanding was that it was a local career source decision to limit it to adults. I could, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but just if we could just follow up on that. Thank I'd be you happy so much. to. That, I mean, that aligns with our vision. So thank you. I agree. Any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. DS4. I recommend the board approve the purchase of a marketing package with Valpac Direct Marketing Systems, Inc. For the period of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023, not to exceed $429,579.63. Motion. Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Discussion, Dr. Robinson. Okay, sorry, Mr. Tierney, I guess I'm picking on you today, but um, I just pulled this to say, it. what triggered in my mind is that this is a prime opportunity, not only for small businesses, right, local businesses, but also for students as entrepreneurs. I, I cannot retrieve from my memory banks what school it was, whether it was local or another place, that I saw students who were actually operating their own printing business, right? And so as we talk about entrepreneurship, I'm good with this for today. I don't like the piggyback. It's a piggyback. I don't like the piggyback. This is an opportunity for local people, right? Um, but let's just think entrepreneurship and think about our students and because how great would it be for them to be printing this information for adult ed start their own company you know and and learn the whole the whole business operation so thank you vice chair bro thank you and i know it's going to be difficult for you to track but when students do come to enroll if there's a way for you to capture um how they heard about the program because um I've not seen a lot of success with that particular marketing tool, um, but it's definitely something that might reach out into those families. So if there's a way for you to ask and somehow keep track of how they've heard about the program, um, we should see, because it's not a small amount of money and you know it might be worthwhile to see whether we want to continue it afterwards. And we do Thank have you. a tracking piece on that. There's a QR code. Uh, that will be attached to the, and it's, it's going to be postcard mailing to every 670,000 households. And, and you can take a picture of that QR code. It'll take us to our digital flip book, which was the old educator system. It's a follow-up. Um, so you, are you talking about the envelopes that they have everything in it, or is this a separate mailing? Post. It's a postcard. Yeah. So you're doing a direct mail piece through them. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. I thought it was in the envelope with all the others that we toss away. Th that's a piece of it, but the main piece is the postcards. Okay, but we thank you. Track return on investment. That's perfect, thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Yes, thank you. Uh, FMT1, I wanna explain, I, I need to move this to new business to make a change here today, so I have a substitute recommendation. And the, the reason for that is, initially we were looking to borrow potentially up to 225 million for new construction. We're increasing that to 230 million just to give us some leeway with rising construction costs if we will only borrow what we what we need so we may, this is a not to exceed amount and then also uh, this is being changed due to the interest rates you probably saw the Federal Reserve raised interest rates today uh, we are increasing the potential rate from five and a half to six percent 
Uh, hopefully we'll do better than that, uh, but rates are on the rise. So that, that's the reason for the substitute recommendation, which is I recommend the board authorize the resolution to issue certificates of partic participation series 2022A with an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $230 million. Motion by Mrs. Andrews. Second by Ms. Ayala. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. LR1, I recommend the board approve the tentative agreement pending ratification by the Palm Beach County Police mm -hmm. Benevolent Association. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. P3, I recommend the board approve the personnel addendum as submitted. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-1 with Ms. Ayala in opposition. Okay, uh, agenda item POLA1. Uh, tonight I'm asking the board to consider amending the policy. I'd like to add a phrase uh, in two parts of the policy. And that phrase is, or superintendent's designee immediately following uh, assistant superintendent of teaching and learning as well as immediately following chief of equity and wellness on lines 300 and 301 of the proposed policy uh, to the recommendation that I'll read now. I recommend the board approve the adoption of proposed policy 5.735 parents bill of rights and notification of right to involvement in Palm Beach County Schools. General Counsel, do we need to take two motions? One on the change? Correct. So on the superintendent's change to add those words, those designee words, um, we need a motion. Motion by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Ms. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Now a motion to approve the policy as modified by the superintendent's first request. Motion by Ms. Ayala, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 -0. Motion carries. Oh, discussion, I thought you were voting. No, okay. sorry, sorry, Go sorry, ahead. sorry. Okay, so, yeah, this, so this policy gives me heartburn. Um, I get that, so I consider this the fruit of the poisonous tree. This policy is based on what I consider to be bad, non-specific law that opens the door and provides room for hate, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't specify really to me um, in many ways to how to carry out the hate, but it opens the door, right? Um, I am also understand that, what, a week or two ago, uh, Florida Department of Education sent a, a memo saying that they were going to clarify in January, and then now I see an email that they're supposed to have some kind of clarifying meeting on June 29th. Can anybody verify that? Yes, um, the FLDOE sent out a memo indicating that they would be issuing clarification on the portion related to um, the uh, age appropriate instruction on gender identity and sexual orientation for students in grades four and above. Okay, thank you. So. So this, this, um, this the, the, the law, the, the bill that preceded it, and this policy, um, I think there's a lot of confusion, uh, but it's, it's based on fear. And the fear of what this could allow to happen. And one of the speakers said that being seen is close to being loved, right? which struck me, because our vision statement says we see you, right? And so what I need, and I think I tried to speak to this before in terms of outlining um, clear um, guidelines or direction or boundaries or guardrails or whatever for, for teachers and others so that they don't have to figure out, they don't have to interpret this, right? And so it troubles me that, that we are bringing forward this policy that I think is based on bad law without outlining 
that guidance. Can I offer a response? The, we are working on providing additional guidance. Um, and I would agree with your assessment that people are uh, afraid of the worst case scenario with this law and this policy. Um, we've gotten a little bit more guidance from the FDOE on June 6th that uh, kind of narrowed our immediate focus. They said we had to be compliant, you know, in grades K through three as it relates to sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, and then they mentioned that as far as like what's age and developmentally appropriate, uh, that they're going to be working on their guidance and they'll have that by January of 23. So they told school districts basically you could stand down on that piece of it. Uh, but one of the key things we found also working through with DOE guidance, and I think some of the concerns around a lot of our materials is that it's not so much the material itself, but how you teach it. Mm -hmm. And that we need to be training our teachers to be sure that uh, they can deliver all the facts necessary. They can teach history, but they just, they cannot uh, impose their own viewpoint. They have to be careful that the students think for themselves and come to their own viewpoints. And uh, so it's, um, I think as we work through this process and we comply with this law, at the end of the day, I'm very hopeful and confident that we're going to see very few materials that actually have to be removed. Um, and that it's more a matter of like how we use these materials to make sure that we're not um, imposing, you know, or in, it, as what we're accused of is indoctrination, that we're not doing that. And I don't think we do, but we'll just have to be very careful in this climate. Okay, well, I have Ms. Whitfield first and then Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak to the, the students and young adults who spoke tonight, and I just want to tell you um, thank you so much. I, uh, I very, was very impacted by your words, and I want you to know that um, this, this item is going to have to pass tonight because we have to adopt it. It's one of the rules that we have, um, but I'm still here for you. And I still believe that we as a school board will take care of you. And we're going to do uh, what we can to make sure that this district is welcoming to every student. And I say that to mean every student, um, even the people who uh, don't like us and don't you know, agree with us. I welcome your students as well. Uh, one of the things that people have uh, said during this bill is that you know, we're finally giving the power back to parents. Well. To me, you've always had power in this district. Every parent should have power, and I am a parent, and I feel that I have the right to go and talk to my teachers and my principal and everyone about what's going on in my classes. So if you don't feel that that's happening for your student, let us know. But if you're a student who is afraid of this bill, I want you to know that you know, as a school board and as a person who sits on this board, I want to be here for you, and I want to make sure that you know, we are uh, supporting you and you are welcome in our school system. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you so much, Ms. Whitfield. I like what you're saying and I just want to be clear that uh, the students that spoke tonight, I just really appreciate you uh, having the courage to speak. I've been working closely uh, with a lot of the GSA clubs within the school district of Palm Beach County and I will be on those campuses with you, uh, working with your principals and your teachers because we feel that you are so important to us. We love you, we love all of our students and we're not going to separate anybody. And we want you to know your voice is so important to us. And so your, your voice tonight is great, but I've been listening to a, a lot of the students throughout the year. And this has been really bad because it's caused a lot of anxiety, but this school board supports you. I personally can speak for myself and as well as this school board, we're gonna be there for you. But I, I wanna make sure that uh, I say this part uh, is for the teachers, I worry, because I wanna make sure there's training and staff development so that you know things are happening. July 1st is upon us as we speak and people are off on vacation and they won't be coming back to school for a while. So I just really, uh, through the chair to the superintendent, wanna make sure that school centers and principals and staff development uh, mentors that work with the schools, make sure that we help every, every teacher, every staff that understand what the new policy is and how we can help them as they move forward in teaching and instructing each day. And certainly, uh, Find a way if you find a teacher that's a little bit leery or concerned about how to do this. 
let's make sure we put them at the top of the list. But I want everybody trained to know that we're behind our teachers 100% and we want them to be successful with what they have to do in teaching our children. And I want the children to know this school board supports you 100% with this policy and the law, which we have to kind of go on with. And we don't agree with it. As you know, we wrote our letters to complain. But we're going to be there for you and monitor this situation, students as well as teachers and schools. We, the school board, will stand behind you. Dr. Robinson, Ms. Pearl, then I'm Ms. Ayala. Thank you. So, but. All right. The point the superintendent made is exactly the point, though. So today, this is one of the reasons I decided to go back to my black history facts. So I've been trying to get the truth of my ancestral story shared for, like, what, like 28 years or something, like a ridiculous amount of time, 22 years from here, right? And starting to get traction, right? Um, and so I get what happens when you're not seen, okay? I get what happens when um, you're just supposed to be like, you know, a shaded person from a different culture, right? That's not who I am. And so that's why when we did our vision statement, I wanted, we see you in there. That's, I, I, I got that. I won't even go into the detailed story about that. But, but when I shared some of that history, so I, I shared the story about the lawsuit when they were, when the, the school board of education increased the pay for white teachers and not black teachers. That's fact. That was not my opinion. I was not trying to indoctrinate the board, okay? And so if a teacher teaches that, the facts, somebody's gonna accuse them of indoctrination. Because what happens, what we should be doing is teaching children to think, huh? Right? And so just like I got sent out of class for thinking, <laughs> I won't even tell you that story. But so children will think if we give them facts and people will complain. And so what is going to happen then, right? I mean, I get, this is a bit rhetorical, but these, they have put us quite intentionally between the rock and hard place, no matter what we do, it won't be right nor good, okay? And, and we here, we had, we had that equity statement that people complained about, and so we made it a little bit weaker, okay? Now, when we did that, and, and you know what, and guess what, there was conversation up here about it didn't really substantively change the statement. And actually, I agree with that, right? But you know why I voted not to change that statement? Because that's just the first damn thing. And then there's another one. And then there's another one. And it's like, and what is it they're saying about they came to kill the Jews and I didn't say anything, and then they came to somebody else and I didn't say anything, and, then, and they came to get me, and there was nobody left? That's why we have to stand up, okay? I'm not going to support this. I get it is based on the law. Right? I think it's bad law. I, you know, I'm trying to configure in my mind, like how, do, how does it happen that that law gets challenged, right? But what I'm saying is what we need to do is make affirmative statements that guide our administrators and teachers to make sure that they continue to see each of our students and value them and their story in our classrooms. Nobody can be erased. I'm done. Vice, <clears throat> Vice Chair Brill and then Ms. Ayala. Thank you. So I'm not going to repeat what my colleagues have said for the most part, but I just completely am in agreement with all of you. Um, my takeaway, um, first of all, I'm profoundly upset about the bullying. Profoundly upset. So we need to make sure we have safeguards in place for our students so that everybody feels welcome and that our teachers feel welcomed. Um, also, I, I made a couple notes when Emmy Kenny was speaking about us looking at our policies, about the teacher training. So what I wanted to say is that we have to follow the law. We need to have a policy in place. But we can put the other safeguards in place 
for you to feel safe and for you to feel secure because everybody is welcomed in our schools. And yes, we need to see all of our students, regardless of their race, religion, differing abilities, LGBTQ+, sexual preferences, everybody should be welcomed, and that's including our staff. So thank you. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so first I want to speak to the youth here. You're so incredibly brave for coming into a place where you are not always made to feel welcome, where people around you may not want you to feel welcome. And I want to say thank you for being who you are and for coming in and speaking directly to us and how we can better support you. Um, I also want to thank that many advocates who are within our community and in this room who have continuously pushed us to advocate to do the best that we can do. I know that you've all kept up with the pushback we as a board or as individuals did for this legislation. We asked our lobbying teams to explain why this would cause real threats, danger, life threats to our students. We wrote a letter. We lobbied. We asked our dele delegation members in the legislature not to do it. And I regret that this state did not prioritize you and protect you. And I'm sorry that I could not do more. But what I can do is tell you what we can do here from this body in these rooms. We are talking about things like, and I have to thank Pete Storr on our team, who is an absolute amazing advocate. Uh, just we could not do the work that we do without you, and we wouldn't have the progress we have on these books without you. And he has walked me through some things that we have in place and things that we can really teach about and train to mitigate the negative impacts of this law, which is bigoted and hateful and only intends to separate and sow division and make people feel less than. So what are we doing? We can do things like using last name during roll calls, making sure that we're not dead naming or misgendering children because that's harmful. We can do things that are in our LGBTQ plus critical support guide and not just say it's there, but actually train our employees to understand that that is what we expect of them. We can do things like gender neutral restrooms that are available to all individuals on campus. We already have this in our LGBTQ plus critical support guide, but I am working with our team to make sure that throughout our district facilities have that in place so that you're not sent to walk a mile to use a restroom that you feel comfortable using. We're also talking about GSAs. And I know that one of my colleagues up here, many of my colleagues up here are very, are, attend these meetings, want to know what's going on with the students. We are talking about, we have GSA clubs in most of our high schools and 13 middle schools. We are encouraging more sponsors to step up and offer these opportunities in our schools. Um, we also send out a monthly GSA newsletter to let them know about events that are coming up to get involved. Um, and I also would like, you know, to see our principals updated on what they can do to include this as part of their club offerings on campus that don't have it already. Um, and, you know, the, the thing that really got me was during a DTEC meeting, we found out that our suicide prevention training doesn't discuss trans kids when their rate of suicide attempts and unfortunate suicide success is 45%. So we're talking about... <laughs> 10 times more than cisgender straight children, and they're not discussed in a suicide training for the employees that are tasked with protecting them on our schools. That is unacceptable. So we have work to do. We can do the things that we still can do. The state is the state. We're Palm Beach County, and as you've heard from this board, we are committed to making sure that your experience is going to be what it needs to be, which is fair, open, accessible, positive, and not one that is full of fear, bullying, and being made to feel less than by anybody. So that is what we are doing. We are continuing to work on the improvements. And I just wanted to say all of that to you because I want to thank the advocates who always hold us accountable. Many of you are in this room. You're from Compass Community Center. You're from the Human Rights Council of Palm Beach County, organizations that I support very much and that I am a proud member of however I can be. And I just thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you for what you do and who you are and know that you have an advocate and a supporter and an ally in me. Mrs. Andrews. Ms. Andrews, go ahead. And I just have to add this piece. Uh, I thank you, Dr. Sheffield. I thank you, Diana Fetterman. And I thank you, Pete Stewart. Because I sit on the State of Florida, Equality Florida School Board Council. I've been working for the last couple of years. There are a lot of lawyers working. Uh, on this whole process that we're having to deal with. 
Uh, we have an excellent team here with the school district of Palm Beach County. I'm interfacing with school boards across the state uh, fighting for your rights. And I just want you to know you are not alone. And, uh, and our school district administration has been great with fighting and we're gonna continue fighting for your rights. And I'm glad you came to the school board meeting tonight and spoke, but we will be out in front at your schools with you, working with your parents, working in the community. And we're not gonna let anybody intimidate us because you are important. All of our students are important. But when we think about our LGBTQ plus students, you are most at risk when we think about suicide and hate and destruction of your life. And I promise you, I'll stand up for you wherever I go. And I know this board will too. Is there any more discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries five two with Dr. Robinson and Ms. Ayala in opposition. Thank you, uh, TL5. I recommend the school board approve the VPK provider contract effective August 10th, 2022 through August 9th of 2023 and the school readiness and CSC provider contracts effective July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 with the Early Learning Coalition of Palm Beach County and authorize the superintendent or his designee to sign all related documents and contracts. Motion by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Discussion, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. I, I, it's not often that I do this, but I pulled this to say thank you. So I wanted to say, um, really say thank you to Early Learning Coalition and Children's Services Council. Not only do they give us money, right, but, uh, but they also support um, efforts um, in partnership with us to improve kindergarten readiness. So I just, I just passed out some um, what we call the power standards which were developed through the Riviera Beach Pre-K Collaborative in partnership between um, private providers and our kindergarten teachers, where they met and talked about what do children really need to know in kindergarten. So we stopped looking at, um, you know, a mile wide and, and go, you know, a half mile deep instead, right? And, and to share that information with parents. So this document, is for parents so that parents could be more active partners with us in getting their children ready for kindergarten. I say all this to say that I have been somewhat disappointed in uh, the school district's um, early childhood program, what appears to be, um, I'm gonna call it selfishness, right? Because we have certified teachers and our private providers do not we have access to some dollars that private providers do not. Um, and we honestly have more expertise in-house than the private providers do. And so this is my request that on a go forward basis that we work in true partnership, true collaboration with Early Learning Coalition and Children's Services Council with um, the private providers that are providing early childhood education services because they're, the children come into our schools in kindergarten whether we help or not. And so we had such great um, improvement through the Riviera Beach Pre-K Collaborative. I mean, and, and I'm gonna wind it up in a second, but I just, I do wanna brag. So the, the year I started the Pre-K um, collaborative, two of the four elementary schools in Riviera Beach had zero children deemed ready for kindergarten on the kindergarten readiness, readiness assessment. And the one that had the highest readiness was like 17%. That the year after we started this collaboration with the school district, CSC, Early Learning Coalition, and, and the private providers, um, Riviera Beach had the highest gains in kindergarten readiness of any place in the county, at which point then I was asked, and I think that Ms. Whitfield was asked, to start additional pre-K collaboratives. I just want to make sure that the collaboration does not wither away when I'm not sitting here to harass you. That is my request. And so this is a thank you, and it's also a 
but I'll be watching you, okay? Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Takes us to the end of the agenda, so we're back to the non-agenda speakers. Yes? Go ahead, Mrs. Andrews. Whatever you'd like to do is fine with me. I, I didn't pull it, but I can't let this evening go without me thanking uh, the Mary and Robert Pugh Public Education Fund. And I just want to read a couple of things about what they did for us here in the school district before we leave here tonight. It says, we are pleased to inform you that the Board of Trustees of the Mary and Robert Pugh Public Education Fund has awarded the school district of Palm Beach County a grant of $99,300 for, to the K-12 Department of Teaching and Learning. This grant is a, awarded to support collaborative field trips, and this is what we always ask for, field trip experience with the John D. MacArthur Beach State Park for high need schools. This grant is for the period of April 22, 2022 through June 30th, 2025. And they are going to do professional development, materials, transportation costs associated with the in-depth field trip experiences, both real and virtual, for our high-need schools in collaboration with the John D. MacArthur Beach State Park. That's worth me taking this minute, I didn't do it earlier, to say thank you to the Pew Foundation. You're always here with us, taking care of our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Okay, I'll call three speakers at a time. Alexandra Burke, Erica Esch, Winna Dunmire. Please come up to the podium in whatever order you get there. It's yours. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Hi, I'm adding more details to transgender tennis uh, situation in New Jersey, which my son mentioned before your meeting. I called the mother, and she stated that uh, uh, it was easy way to get to college for free. She's definitely not planning to use any chemical castration or any surgeries to her son. Boy is 100% straight boy. She also stated, let my boy have fun in girls' locker room. One more time, I want to say Governor DeSantis for protecting our children and girls' sport. Anyway, I can see a big problem, potential problem in our county because of current bathroom locker room policies. Is it time to change it? I will wait for public review of the policies. Uh, let's not wait until it's too late. I also want to talk about school safety because of the recent tragedy in Texas, about long-term solution to the problem. I have been carefully monitoring fifth grade curri curriculum. I need, I read almost all suggested book and realized that you are targeting how you can call kids from marginalized group and converting them to mentally unstable criminals. Any person, specifically child, need a dream, something to look for in the future. If a child has a decent family, your plans is not going to work. But for a kids with no stable homes, you propaganda teaching. No need for a father pi figure. Not a single book discussing a good, understanding, caring father. So boys don't want to be fathers. Every chance you have, you demolish faith. Any faith, Judaism or Christianity. Board even did not allow my son to have a presentation about Passover in Easter. No absolute moral values. Girl, for you are not beautiful future ladies who should be treated with respect. Girls, for you are menstruated creatures who push in tampons to vaginas. Number four, you constantly kill an American dream for our children. You and forbid celebrate Columbus Day. You are constantly pushing kids to hate each other based on everything you can come up with. Do you understand that providing special privilege to one specific group, you promoting unfairness and eventually hate from both sides? What do you think? A lonely teenager who doesn't believe in anything 
Do not laugh anybody could do. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Erica Esch, Winna Dunmire. Hello, my name is Erica Esch, and I'm back to speak again, hopefully without redundance, and just to satisfy the further clarification of some of the things we've already went over. Thank you for all of your commitments that you've made tonight and for promoting the honest safety of our students above the gain, the lobbyism that has purported the most violent history for our students in the past couple of years, I'd say, legislatively. Um, so the school board superintendent and the removal of those three books we discussed, we don't need to readdress. We know that that was a mark of a choice that we know we could redact, and that's something I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, and we're also here to call out the unredeemable qualities of white supremacist patriarchy beyond the individual, right? Um, beyond the case by case. So what does that mean to me, to you? Could be all different, clearly to everyone in this room. We could have a different idea. Um, so I think that it would be best if possibly, maybe, and this is a suggestion from the public as we know, if there were more meetings committed to having open forum discussions that wouldn't centralize agenda or not agenda items, thus making them more, um, open to the non-political conversations that we need to be having with our community members without making them um, subject to addressing a certain policy or non-policy, given that a lot of these issues are human rights concerned and they don't only affect the school board or the school institution itself, but do end up in your care. So being as it is incidental, we happen to live here or purposeful, we would like to keep our state safe. And within the time of living here, we only have so many places, locations, sites for contestation to perform that. Um, I find it very unhelpful that most of the time that we are given, being it is three minutes, doesn't often share in the capacity that we need to have that dialogue that all of you say is there. I personally, in my time at the education system, I was attending Park Vista, I never saw a superintendent at my school. And that's not because I wasn't a good kid. I was a very poorly behaved kid and I eventually graduated and I'm going into law. I want there to be support for people like me in that school, people who don't share my experiences and things I cannot experience myself from the knowledge base, even ingesting it in literature from the teacher's mouth. I want to know that there will be someone to walk someone compa compassionately and sensitively through that material and not have it removed simply because we don't have the means to afford our children the time and the patience because that's what it shows up as. Thank you. My name's Winna Dunmire, and I'm a parent of two children in PVC schools, a senior at Atlantic, a senior, and an eighth grader at Congress Middle. Today I'm here as a volunteer with and on behalf of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. We thank the board for signing this proclamation today for your acknowledgement of the public health scourge of gun violence. The first Friday in June is set aside to honor the victims and survivors of gun violence. It's, time to share the, it's a time to share the stories of those we've lost and commit ourselves to ending gun violence everywhere. Moms Demand Action is the largest grassroots all-volunteer gun violence prevention group in the nation with over 8 million supporters. And I joined three days after the horror at Parkland over four years ago. Back then I'd comment that 92 Americans die by gun violence every day and over 100 are wounded. Now four years later I have to amend my language and say 110 Americans die by gun violence every day and over 200 are wounded. We're creating a nation of gun violence survivors and it must stop. As a critical part of our community, schools play a role in gun violence prevention. We know that in the last two years, gun violence has overtaken motor vehicle ac accidents as the leading cause of death for our children and teens. We know that in 77% of school shootings, at least one person, most often a peer, knew of that shooter's plan. We know that black children and teens are 14 times more likely than their white peers to die by gun homicide. We know 4.6 million children are at home with unsecured guns and the suicide rate for teens and especially, sadly, young teens keeps rising. From this data, you can see our decades of inaction in the face of escalating gun violence has had significant impacts on our children. Our children are gun violence survivors. It's enough. So what can the school district do? School leadership can pursue the approaches that have been shown to, keep effective, shown to be effective to keep guns out of schools addressing students' health, empowering teachers to intervene if students show warning signs, improving schools' physical security in a targeted way, and keeping guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them. 
Educating the school community on safe gun storage can save lives, from curious youngsters to an older child in a moment of crisis. Keeping guns locked and separate from ammunition saves lives. Educating our school, school community using a safe gun storage framework like the Be Smart program saves lives. Research-based approaches must be seen through a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or we risk causing more harm. Also, we must not impose solutions that put the burden of gun violence prevention on our children. That's our load to carry and our problem to solve. So what can we do? Call your senators. There's some good legislation making the way through the Senate. Call them every day. Public pressure works. And if you want to do more, join me and fight gun violence by texting READY, the word READY, R-E-A-D-Y, to 64433. You don't have to be a mom. You just have to want to make this end. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Rory, Rory Geller Mohammed. Carlene Paul and Jermaine Womack. Pablo Del Rio, Martha Guthrie, Hope Mucklow. Good afternoon, Superintendent Mike Burke, distinguished school board members, Dr. Robinson, Marcia Andrews, Karen Biller, Erica Wilfield, and staff. My name is Colleen Paul. I stand before you as a spokesperson for Volunteer Association in front of Florida. We work in collaboration with Florida Rising, which I am a proud member of. We also partner with other organizations in the community, such as Black Caucus of Palm Beach County, Unify, and the set of Delray Beach, to name a few. I would like to also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Robinson and Superintendent Burke, who brought an entire team to meet with us to discuss issues pertaining to our community. We felt very positive after our last meeting because we felt the team that's working on the dual language program is doing a great job. We are looking forward to working with them as a community partner to assure the success of the dual language program at Rolling Greens Elementary for the fiscal year 2022 and 2023. Although we are ecstatic to have this program, we want to express our concern regarding some issues that are of utmost importance to the Haitian American community. One, cultural representation in school and the community. Hiring role models to serve as principal, AP, teachers, counselors, front office staff that can speak and understand Haitian Creole. Two, lack of resources. Educating the Haitian American community about the ins and outs of the Palm Beach school system is of great concern to Volunteer Association and Funds of Florida. We want to work as a partner with the public school system to assure that the language barrier that exists between the Haitian parents and the school system is a thing of the past. Three, after school program. Our parents have on several occasions requested assistance for after school program that would help their children in the areas of reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. We also would like to partner with the school system to make sure that parents are aware that this program will be available for the fiscal year 23, 22, 23 fiscal year. And this program should be free. Remember, guys, I told you in the past, I am a retired teacher. I have nothing but time. I am looking forward in working with your guys to make the school year for Haitian American children and their parents to be one of the most successful school year. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Good evening, my name is Jermaine Womack. I'm a parent of two black, beautiful kids. My family has been a long residence in uh, Palm Beach County since the 19, early 1900s. I've had the pleasure of attending some of the best schools in the county, Sun Coast class of 2003. But what I'm seeing now in the current state of the school system is, uh, and where it's headed is kind of scary. My kids deserve to be prepared for the future. We need to teach them both the good and the bad of our history 
so we can avoid making the same mistakes. It may be easy, easier to deny or avoid our challenges, but that is never how we overcome them. You must first identify an issue and address that issue to learn and grow from that. They want to distort the truth and sanitize history at a time when awareness and systematic racism is growing as a result of last year's George Floyd and the COVID impact of black, indigenous, Latin, Asian, Pacific Islander communities. And with that being said, I stand in solidarity with Common Purpose and its affiliate organizations. I also stand in solidarity with the Volunteer Association and their efforts to increase the number of administration and school staff on the campuses will hire Haitian population to really rehabilitate the South's intensive uh, renovation. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, board. My name is Marsha Guthrie. I am the mom of an incoming senior in Palm Beach County school system. I am here tonight to speak about what I recognize is the ongoing challenges that this school board is dealing with as a result of thinking through the implementation of the divisive legislation, the Individual Freedoms Act, and the Parents' Bill of Rights. My remarks, uh, I'm gonna shift a little bit because I'm, gonna, I'm speaking after the policy has already passed. And so what I want us to be thinking about is what this implementation can look like moving forward that supports a learning atmosphere that is going to promote each student's learning. So when we say individual freedom, whose freedoms are we talking about? Currently, this legislation is stifling freedom. It is stifling freedom of our children. It is not giving them enough credit to think about how learning is to be challenging. Discomfort is not an antithesis to learning. It actually helps to complement learning because it allows for innovation and curiosity. And I'm imploring the board to think about how are we inviting students, parents into the conversation as well as educators about the path forward. In my household, I know I am raising a well-rounded child one who can learn about complex issues and subjects without internalizing self-hate or shame. We owe it to our children to give them the benefit of the doubt to make up their own minds about learning about diversity and inclusion. Our children are richer when they have a range of experiences that expose them to cultures different than their own. Hate is taught. I saw that tonight. Hate is taught. Hate is given a script, and hate is now legislated. It does not have to be that way in Palm Beach County schools. We owe it to the future of our humanity to bring back love, to not be driven into the hateful rhetoric of the darkest places of our society. I implore you to stand to the truth, to turn down the volume on those who scream at you to cower about the things that you already know are right. I stand and we stand today in solidarity for common sense, common ground, and common purpose against the common enemy, which is white supremacy. That is the evil demon, not, the bl not my blackness, not the black skin of my beautiful black child, not the queer children that I love and support, not Hispanic, Latinx, or indigenous um, kids. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Pablo Del Real, and I am the founder of Soil and Soul. We're a grassroots organization based here in Palm Beach County, and we work with the school district in a couple of ways, uh, but before I describe those collaborations, I do want to say that I am here with Common Purpose, and I also want to say that Soil and Soul is a mobilizing partner for the Poor People's Campaign, the Mass Assembly scheduled for June 18th, this Saturday in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I should say nobody's paying me to speak tonight, unfortunately. Uh, so the ways in which we collaborate with uh, the school district are two. One is high school mindfulness clubs. So we've heard about hate tonight, 
And I want to talk a little bit about love and belonging in high school. Because hate is taught, uh, but love can also be taught. And so when we hear about uh, gun violence awareness and anti-bullying and anti-racism, and all those things are necessary, but I want to come from what we support and what we want to cultivate and grow first and then move to what we oppose. So in high school mindfulness clubs, we've been working uh, with the school district for four years. It's an after school program. We've been at four campuses. We've been at uh, Atlantic High in Delray. We've been at uh, Lake Worth. We've been at <coughs> Inlet Grove in Riviera Beach. And we've been at John I. Leonard in Green Acres. And we spend, uh, after school, uh, we spend about 90 minutes with students, and uh, we generate the energy of mindfulness for that time. And we have four guidelines. We use loving speech, deep listening, no fixing, and confidentiality. And in the four years, I think our students, together with our experienced mindfulness teachers, have, have hit upon a solution that could grow from the little grassroots effort that we have to a larger scale solution to expand the love and belonging that students feel in the mindfulness clubs to students uh, at all the schools. Because the, 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 school, the, the students who become school shooters, they don't feel love or belonging. And they need to be taught how to feel those things. They need to be exposed to those things. And we're doing it on a very small scale. I want to partner a little bit more with the school district this summer in particular. I want to uh, offer a wisdom and justice camp for high school students. They're the ones most affected by school shootings. They should be part of the solution. And they are part of the solution in the schools where we are. And so uh, wellness and equity folks, we want to work with you to bring love and belonging to high school students in Palm Beach County. Thank you. Is Rory Geller Mohammed here? Hope Mucklow, Sheila Gaines, Chuck Ridley, Jane Tierney. One second, I'm short. Good evening, my name is Sheila Gaines. My family was raised in Palm Beach County since 1908. As a black parent that attended Palm Beach County Public Schools with children that currently attend Palm Beach County Public Schools, I'm concerned. The small amount of black history I learned while attending public schools planted a seed in me. It encouraged me to learn more about the kings and queens that were stolen and brought over to a foreign land to be forever known as slaves in the history books. That small seed encouraged me at times when America was unforgiven to be or look like me. No matter our color, background, or zip code, we want our kids to have an education that imparts honesty about who we are, integrity in how we treat others, and courage to do what's right. Certain politicians, Ron DeSantis, the governor, wants to include my children, exclude my children, denying their school's fundings, and writing people who look like them out of our history books and writing people who look like them out of our history books. We know better than to give into lies that prevent us from learning our country's true, true racial history and understanding how it shapes our lives today. Having honesty and courage conversations about systemic racism helps us achieve the promise of racial equity. We achieve racial equity when a person's race no longer determines the opportunities in their life. Because of systemic racism, it often does, to the detriment of us all. Advancing racial equity will benefit us all, strengthening our neighborhoods, our cities, and our states. I wasn't paid to be here either but I too stand in solidarity with Common Purpose and its affiliates. 
Also, I stand in solidarity with the Volunteer Association and their efforts to increase the number of administration and staff on school campus. With a high Haitian population to rehab the South intensive renovation. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Board. Um, my name is Chuck Ridley and I have the privilege of being the chair of Unify Palm Beach County. Unify exists for one simple purpose. It's, that's to build power for the black community and black people. I've been organizing as a multi-generation, generation of African who happens to live in America for over 30 years. And I've seen a lot in that lifetime. I've seen a lot of threats come before this school district, but none more, no threats like I've seen over the last couple of years. I've watched this board be attacked. I've watched folk come to humiliate you and sometimes even come to humiliate your families. I have a hard tongue. I've said things that are unkind to you. But I've grown to respect this board for what I've seen over the last couple of years. And why have you been attacked? Well, I've watched a governor and his administration that tries to turn our kids' classrooms into battlegrounds, spreading lies about lessons that they are being taught so that he may become a governor or maybe even the president of these United States. I've watched the governor and his administration threaten to deny funding because you chose to either follow the CDC recommendations or actually work on equity. So I'm not ever going to be someone that is going to sing kumbaya. That's just not the way I'm made up. But I have decided to stand with Unify in solidarity with common purpose. Common purpose of come together as a response to a governor and a mega, a mega activist who will want to wreak havoc on this school district, no matter your race, your gender, your sexual organ, uh, orientation, they look to do harm. So with that stated, I also stand in solidarity with the Volunteer Association. I stand in solidarity with the LGBTQ plus um, community and young people. I stand in solidarity with moms' demands um, and actually, I joined their fight against violence. We can do better to this school board in the spirit of my ancestors. Boom shakalaka. Good evening. My name is Jane Tierney. I am part of the Common Purpose uh, Coalition here. I stand in solidarity with all the speakers who have gone before me. I want to start by paraphrasing Albert Einstein, who said that humans are part of the whole called the universe, and that's an optical delusion of our minds that we see ourselves as separate from the rest. That's a kind of prison for us. He says, our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion. Florida's enactment of the so-called stop woke and don't say gay laws are the antithesis of widening our circle of compassion. In reality, these laws represent a circling of the wagons, the wagons of racism, homophobia, and transphobia. The don't say gay law is justified by words such as protect and safety for our children, but the requirements of the law belie these purposes. The impact is increased exposure to bullying, harassment, homophobia, and transphobia. 
is our responsibility and the district's responsibility to do everything in our power to keep our children safe in this increasingly hostile environment. As to the Stop Woke law, if the goal is to criminalize woke, what does it mean to be unwoke? As I thought about this, the words that came to mind were complacent on cruise control, self-oriented, self-satisfied, lacking interest in other people not like me, essentially to mindlessly reside in Einstein's prison of separation. The Stop Woke Law imposes new restrictions on race-related instructions. As a result, black history, discussions of race and disequities are being edited and purged from the curriculum, again, to protect our children. Let me expand on that, to protect our white children from feeling uncomfortable. When a person leaves out important information or fails to correct a pre-existing misconception in order to hide the truth from others is by definition a lie of omission. Our children have the right and des to and deserve the truth. It is our collective responsibility to ensure they receive it. The anti-racist, anti-homophobic, anti-transphobic coalition will only continue to grow in strength to speak out and to stand up for our children. I believe I called all of your names that signed up to speak. So if I missed anybody, I still have Hope Muckrow. I don't, Mucklow, I don't think she spoke, but I called her name. Board members, that's the end of the agenda, but don't rush off because we have the leasing corporation meeting right afterwards. I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. The school board meeting is adjourned. The quality order the, uh, the Palm Beach leasing corporation meeting. Um, with the board chair, board clerk, please take the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. She's, she's here. She's here. The superintendent, item for approval, LC1. Yes, LC1 has been modified in the same manner as the item on the earlier agenda, agenda FT, FMT1. Uh, the amount is now up to $230 million and interest rates up to 6%. The substitute recommendation is I recommend the board authorize the resolution to issue certificates of participation. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong recommendation. Let me, let me please start that over. I recommend that the Palm Beach School Board Leasing Corp authorize the resolution to issue COP Series 2022B an aggregate principal amount not to exceed 230 million. Motion by Mrs. Ms. Ayala, second by Mrs. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. We don't need two motions on that, do we, General Counsel? It appears on Based the agenda. Based on the way that it appears on the agenda, no. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Is there any further comments from any board members? I hope not. We need a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Mrs. Andrews. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. The meeting is adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thirteen thousand teachers. We are a tech-driven district. We have smart boards in every single classroom. 2,600 of our teachers are Google certified instructors. That is the most. 